Well, hello, and welcome to the Old Time Movie Radio Show, where we feature old-time radio shows with your favorite old-time movie actors and characters. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Philip Marlowe on the radio. So we're going to begin our evening with the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe. After that, we've got the 1947 radio show, The New Adventures of Philip Marlowe with Van Heflin. And we'll finish up the evening with The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Gerald Moore. So tonight we've got three incredible actors. We've got some great shows with some great action, great writing. So we're sure to be in for an enjoyable evening. Now, just before we get into the show, do you want to take a minute to tell you about a couple ways you can help support the channel? First up, we've got the Johnny Dollar Club. Starting at just a dollar a month, you can help keep these great shows coming. You've got three ways to join. Coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. The links for those are in the description below. And many of you have asked about using PayPal. So if you prefer PayPal, the first option, coffee.com, is a great one for you. And the second way you can help support the channel and get a little something for yourself is to check out our Hearth and Home shop on Etsy. We've got a great assortment of old-time radio-related merchandise, including the Yours Truly Johnny Dollar collection. We've got the old-time radio detective mug series. And our newest collection, starting right now, is, is the Harold Apple Knocker collection. The link for the Etsy shop is in the description below. Head on over and check that out. But now, without any further ado, it's time to sit back and relax and enjoy Philip Marlowe on the radio. Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Dick Powell, Claire Trevor, June Dupre, and Mike Mazurki in Murder, My Sweet. Ladies and gentlemen, your guest producer, Mr. Irving Pitchell. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. In answer to the proverb that a leopard cannot change its spots, we bring you tonight a gentleman who turns his back on many years of light and frothy roles by which he climbed to stardom and takes the part of a ruthless, hard-as-nails detective in a drama as relentless as the crimes that it unfolds. He's Dick Powell, hailed so enthusiastically as Philip Marlowe in RKO's sensational success, Murder, My Sweet. Co-starred with him in her screen role as the fatal and mysterious Helen is Claire Trevor. Also, June Dupre, whose natural loveliness would lead us to expect a touch of romance in our play. And towering above our microphones is Mike Mazurki, as the quietly alarming Moose Malloy. Four characters of widely different natures and conflicting motives, involved in one of the screen's most baffling and complex mysteries, a story that in its published form was one of the best-selling thrillers of our time. Most of the action of Murder, My Sweet takes place right here in Hollywood, not too far from our stage. If you saw the picture, you've seen many Hollywood sites from Malibu Beach to Sunset Towers, from the skyline of Los Angeles to the canyons of our hills. Landmarks as native to Hollywood as the radio and motion picture studios from which these dramas come. In fact, the name Lux on the outside of our theater is, I venture to say, as familiar a landmark in this capital of entertainment as Lux Soap itself is familiar in the dressing rooms of screen scar stars. A standard of complexion care from coast to coast, Lux Toilet Soap is a friendly link between your home and Hollywood. And now, we take you to the downtown section of our city and the first act of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy. When you got something to say, start at the beginning. Okay. It's seven o'clock at night, and I'm in a two-by-four coupe I call my office. I sit at my desk and look at the sign on the door. Philip Marlowe, it says. Philip Marlowe, private investigator. Hmm. That's a nice title for somebody you go to see when you don't want to see the law. I was tired out. I'd been out peeking under old Sunday sections for a barber named Dominic, whose wife wanted him back. I forget why. Anyway, I didn't find him, and the only reason I took the job was because my bank account was trying to crawl under a duck. I just found out all over again how big Los Angeles is. My brain felt like a plumber's handkerchief. I took out my little black book and decided to go grouse hunting. Nothing like soft shoulders to improve my morale. I'm dialing a number when the door opens and he walks in. The mountain that walks like a man. The biggest mug I ever saw outside of a sideshow. You, Marlowe? Yeah? 
I seen your name downstairs. They had the names that was in the building. You're a private eye, huh? That's right. I'd like you to look for somebody. I'm closed up, pal. I looked for her where she worked, but I've been out of touch. Come around tomorrow, we'll talk about it. I think maybe we should do it now. Let go of me, you big ape. I don't mean to do nothing. Here, I'll give you some dough. You come with me. Okay. Okay, I come with you. It ain't far. A cafe on Central Avenue. We can pick up a cab. The place was called Florian's. It looked like trouble, but that didn't bother me. The two twenties, the big lug had dropped, felt nice and snug against my appendix. I tried to figure out who he was looking for. I tried to picture him in love with somebody, but it didn't work. They changed this place a lot. There used to be a stage in some boots. Lattice work and pink flowers. She was cute like a bug's ear. A redhead. Eight years since I've seen her. Six years she didn't write. But she'll have a reason. Yeah, yeah, she'll have a reason. What did you do here, singer? Yeah. Let's you and me nibble a couple. Hey, Jack. Yeah? Whiskey. Hey, boss, he's here again. He said you're here again. Yeah. I came in before. I tried to find her. Now, look, big boy, I told you once I'm sorry about your girl, but she ain't here. Her name is Velma. You never heard of Velma, Mr. Florian? She used to work here. You better drink up, Joe. That lady at the end of the bar. Maybe she knows. I have to request you don't bother the customers, see? Lady, you remember a girl used to work here? Her name was Velma. You talking to me? I said leave the customers alone. So far, you rate me polite, huh? I don't bother you none. Swallow your drink and get out of here. Get out of my way. <laughs> Come on, pal. Eight years is a lot of gin. They don't know anything about Velma here. Some guys has the wrong idea when it gets done. The boss was no lightweight, but Moose picked him up like a rag doll and dropped him in the corner pocket. Moose seemed a little dazed as he walked out, and I tagged after him down the street. That guy in there, he shouldn't have talked to me like that. Sure, sure, pal. What's the next stop? Who asked you to stick your face in? Remember me? I'm the detective you hired, Chunky. Oh, the name is Moose. Cut him, I'm large. Moose Malloy. That place ain't like it used to be. There used to be a stage and some boots. You said that. Maybe I told you too much. Maybe I... Let go my arm. Huh? We was to be married, me and Velma. Where you figure I'd been them eight years I said about? Catching butterflies. San Quentin I'd been. Look, you find Velma for me, huh? Has she got a last name? Velma Valento. Now you beat it. Sure, sure. How do I get in touch with you? I get in touch with you. Tomorrow, maybe. So tomorrow comes and I'm thinking about Moose Malloy and that bucket of mud look on the face of the boss and Florian's when I hear footsteps coming my way down the hall. Moose was coming back, except it wasn't Moose. It was another new customer. Good-looking guy, well-dressed, like a movie star. Mr. Marlowe, my name is Marion. Come in, come in. Who put in the pitch for me, Mr. Marion? Pitch? Oh, and no one, no one. I I saw your name in the classified section of the phone book. I'm in a clutch at the moment, Mr. Marriott. Your what? I'm busy. I couldn't take on anything big. What have you got in mind? I'd like your services tonight, for just a few hours. I'm meeting some men. I, I'm paying them some money. How much money and what for? I can't go into that. I've simply agreed to serve as the bearer of the money. Oh, you just want me to go along and hold your hand. I'm afraid I don't like your manner. Yeah, I've had complaints before, but it keeps getting worse. How much are you offering me for doing nothing? I hadn't got around to thinking about it. You suppose you could get around to thinking about it now? How would you like a swift punch on the nose? Oh, dear, I tremble at the thought of such violence. I, uh, I'll give you a hundred dollars. If that isn't enough, say it's so. It's enough, it's enough. This is all I can tell you. Some jewels were taken from a friend of mine in a holdup. I'm buying them back tonight. Where? I'm to drive my car to a rather secluded canyon near Malibu. Uh-huh. We drive out there to buy back some jewelry for a lady friend. I didn't say that. Chances are that these men, whoever they are, don't intend roughing you up if you play a ball. But they wouldn't like you being twins. Now, one of us might get hurt. No, Mr. Marriott, I'm afraid I can't do anything for you. I see. But I'll take your hundred bucks and tag along for the ride. One more thing. Yes? I carry the shopping money and I do the driving. Very well. We drove down that night. Somehow I knew we were being watched. I didn't see anything. The fog was a nice dish of puree St. Germain. I felt it coming. 
I was a toad on a wet rock and a snake was looking down my neck. Slow down. We're getting near the spot. Shh, quiet. There should be some white posts along the road. Pull in your head. In back of the white post, there's the path. The path goes down into a hollow. That's where we're to wait. Hey, hey, look. Huh? White post. All right, stop the car. Now you sit tight and I'll go down and have a look, see. Have you got a flashlight? Yeah. Don't be more than a couple of minutes. There's nobody here, Marriott. This whole setup looks like a tryout, seeing if you obey orders. Let's pull around the corner and... I caught the blackjack right behind my ear, and a black pool opened up at my feet. I dived in. It had no bottom. I uh, felt pretty good, just like an amputated leg. I don't know how much time went by. I forgot to look at my watch. But as I came to, I started to call for Marriott. Marriott. Marriott! Are you all right? What happened? Well, who, who are you? Oh. Hey, come back here. Come back here. Hello? Hello? Police headquarters. Let me talk to Randall, Inspector Randall. One moment, please. Inspector Randall? Randall, this is Marlowe. Marlowe? Oh, yeah? Yeah, look. I'm at a gas station down near Malibu, the foot of Woodbridge. So? You better get on here. A guy named Marriott's just been knocked off, beaten to death with a blackjack. <laughs> Randall, I told you a dozen times what happened. I'd like you to tell me again, here in my big comfortable office. Who killed Marriott? An amateur killed him, or somebody who wanted it to look like an amateur. Nobody else would hit a man that many times with a sap. Ah, the oftener you go over it, the sillier it sounds. I'd sooner dig eggshells out of a garbage can than information out of you. Oh, I get it. You don't like me. Okay, I'll go home. Right after you start talking sense. For instance? For instance, you don't know anything about Marriott. You don't know how much money you were carrying. You don't know what it was supposed to buy back. Trusting soul, wasn't he? Now, where's the dough? Where? Well, right after I beat out Marriott's brains, and just before I hit myself on the top of the head, I hid the money under a bush. Ah. Uh, and that dame you claim you saw? Uh, she must have thought I was somebody else. She took one look and got out fast. Suppose a jewel outfit got the bright idea of using a private dick for contacts and uh, payoff. Oh, great, great. Now I'm a finger for a heist mob. Look. I'm trying to be helpful. I get up off the nice cold ground. I don't use the car because Marriott's still in it. I walk five miles just so you can be the first to hear the news. I wait for you at the beach and lead you straight to the body so you won't have to wait till next Christmas to find it. I tell you all I know, it sounds screwy. It is screwy, but it's all I know. Sure. Now I'm tired of your bum guesses. Either book me or let me go home. Well, oh, you'd slit your own throat for six bits plus federal tax. Now look, Randall. Go on home and keep your big yap shut. One phony move and you'll be locked up as a material witness. Whoever killed Marriott, I'll get him. Yeah, you'll get him. About the time you get your third set of teeth. And stay away from Marriott's pals. I've been after those boys for a long time and I'm getting close. So watch your step or I may have to pick you up in the same basket with Jules Amthor. Yeah? Hey, is Jules Amthor mixed up in this? Oh, so you know Amthor. I know lots of people in this town, but I never heard of Jules Amthor. Bad guess, Inspector. Good night, Randall. And keep away from the newspapers. I'll do the talking. Well, I went back to my office the next day. I didn't want to be there because my head felt like a nest of rivets. One of my clients was dead, but the other one was still alive, Moose Malloy. And I figured he might be looking for me. Early in the afternoon, this kid walks in. Eh? Yeah, business is getting better and better. Pretty good. My name is Ann Ellison, Mr. Marlowe. I'm a reporter from the Post. Oh, have a seat, Miss Ellison. Police haven't been very helpful on the Marriott murder. I was wondering... There's a question I always ask. How did you know about me? Oh, friends at City Hall. Uh, tell me, did Marriott tell you who owned the jade he was buying back? No. No, he, he didn't. Had you known him long, Marriott? A couple of weeks. Why? Well, I just wondered if you had any theories about... About what happened or what was supposed to happen. Oh, I've, I've got a couple, uh... Say, hey, this is a nice-looking purse. Just what do you mean by opening it? I'd like to prove another theory, that you're not a reporter. Why do dames carry so much stuff in a pocketbook? Give it to me. I was looking for a driver's license, but your bank book will do. 
And the name on this bank book isn't Allison at all. It's Grail. Anne Grail. Please. Oh, you're a hot rock, baby. I could toss you to the cops. Last night, all I could tell them was that Marriott was buying back some jewelry. You could knock their hats off of that line about the jade. Tell me, Miss Grail, have you ever known a girl named Velma Valento, a singer? Never heard of her in my life. Oh, well, it's just a shot in the dark. Besides, it's another case. I was just hoping. Who does that jade belong to? What's your interest in it? My interest? Well, Marriott gave me a hundred bucks to take care of him, and I didn't. I'm just a small businessman in a very messy business, but I like to follow through on a sale. The jade belongs to my father. Oh, I gathered from Marriott that the jade belonged to a lady. My father happens to be married. Oh, oh. Well, your mother was wearing it the night of the holdup. She's not my mother. My mother's dead. My father married again. Who sent you here to feel me out? It was my own brilliant idea. I saw your name in the newspaper. Well, before I talk to Inspector Randall, I think I'll have a talk with your father. And your father's wife. My car's downstairs. Except that I'm expecting to hear from somebody. Well... That case, Mr. Marlowe. In that case, I'll go with you just the same. You're really a lot cuter than Moose Malloy. Come on, let's go. Before Dick Powell and his co-stars return with the second act of Murder, My Sweet, we take you to where there's a local war bond rally going on. And Mrs. White is curious about one of her fellow workers. Uh, Jean, stop here a minute, will you? Tell me. Who is that attractive woman in charge of the next booth? Oh, that's Mrs. Jennings. Lovely looking, isn't she? Her daughter's a classmate of my Susie at college. Oh, now, Jean, don't tell me she's old enough to have a 20-year-old daughter. Well, she looks like a girl herself. It's her skin, I think. I've never seen her when her complexion didn't look like that. So soft and really fresh. Well, that's what a lovely Lux complexion does for a woman. Makes her look radiant, appealing. It's what you notice first about her appearance, that smooth, soft, luxe complexion. Screen stars know how very important it is to have the charm of exquisite skin. That's why they're so careful never to take chances with complexion beauty. Here's what a famous star, Claudette Colbert, says. I never neglect my daily active lather facials with luxe soap. They're so easy, and they work. Here's what I do. I cover my face generously with a creamy lather, work it in thoroughly. I rinse with warm water, then cold and pat my face dry with a towel. Now my skin feels smoother, softer, and it is. These facials the screen stars depend on really do make skin lovelier. Recent tests showed actually three out of four complexions improved in a short time with daily Lux Toilet Soap Care. Why don't you try it? You'll enjoy the extra creamy lather, the gentle caressing way it touches your skin. Nine out of ten famous screen stars use fine white Lux Toilet Soap. Why don't you begin your daily facials with Hollywood beauty soap tomorrow? Irving Pitchell brings our stars back for the second act. With Dick Powell as Philip, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy, we raise the curtain on act two of Murder, My Sweet. Philip Marlowe continues with his story. <laughs> This girl, this Anne Grail, she drove me to her father's place in Brentwood, a cozy eight or nine acres. Okay for the average family, only you'd need a compass to go to the mailbox. House was all right, too, but it wasn't as big as Buckingham Palace. I waited while she sold me to the old folks. It was like waiting to buy a crypt in a mausoleum. And then she called me in. Old man Grail looked like a college professor, and the old lady... Hmm, what an old lady... Blonde, gorgeous, and I guess about 30, with a face and a shape that would make most pinup girls look like Gravel Gertie. She had dimples on her knees, and I was admiring them when the old man started to talk. Do you know anything about jade, Mr. Marlowe? It's uh, green, isn't it? The jade stolen from my wife was a necklace, 60 beads of about six carats each. And very valuable, Mr. Marlowe. And dear, why don't you sit down? What? Oh, yes. How valuable? A somewhat larger necklace recently brought $125,000. Yes, I never should have worn it. It was stupid. Inexcusable. Where was the stick-up? If you'll excuse me, I'm going to lie down. Mrs. Grail will talk to you. I'm most anxious to locate my jade, Mr. Marlowe. I can only hope it can be managed without any publicity. Wait a minute, Father. I'll go with you. May I mix you a drink, Mr. Marlowe? Mm -hmm. Thanks. I hadn't thought there were enough murders these days to make detecting very attractive to a young man. Well, I stir up trouble on the side. 
Uh, tell me, uh, how much of your money was in Marriott's envelope? $8,000. Water or soda? Scotch. We assumed they'd never guess its real value. Who knew you were going to wear the necklace that night? My maid, perhaps. But I trust her implicitly. Why? Because I trust some people. I trust you. Did you trust Tom Marriott? In some things. You're not drinking, Mr. Marlowe. I thought detectives were heavy drinkers. Well, some detectives just encourage other people to drink. <laughs> Shall I tell you about the hold-up? It uh, might help. Well, I'd been out dancing, and Tom was bringing me home. Where have you stopped? Oh, near here. Does it matter a lot? Oh, not too much at the moment, no. How many other guys take you out dancing? I'm very fond of my husband. Only his two steps getting a little stiff. Miss Grail, do you know Jules Amthor? I've heard Tom speak of him. Why? Oh, I don't know. The cops told me to leave Amthor alone. Is he a bad boy? A lot of Tom's friends are, I'm afraid. Tom was rather a heel himself, but a nice heel. You don't know how horrible I feel. Why? Why? Because I'm responsible. I asked Tom to try to buy the necklace back. Oh, I just can't understand the whole business. All they took was a necklace. I was wearing a ring, too, but they didn't want the ring. Uh, about Jules Amthor, what's his racket? No, he's sort of a psychic consultant. I think he's a quack. Tom went to him because he was all mixed up. He, he couldn't get started for fear of failure. I wonder if he'd take my case. <laughs> that sounded like the door closing. It was. Anne's been standing there. Oh, strange child. Mr. Marlowe, you will help me, won't you? Why? Because you like me or are you paying me something in money? Well, I've never hired a detective before. What are the rates? As much as a traffic will bear. How do I find Amthor? <laughs> well, he's really quite inaccessible. Yes? Mr. Amthor is here, Mr. Well, show him in. Well, don't look so smug. He really is inaccessible. I didn't have the faintest idea he'd be coming. Mr. Marlowe, how do you spend your evenings? I'm in the phone book. This is great. Oh, come in, Mr. Amthor. This is Mr. Marlowe. Oh, how do you do? Mr. Marlowe is a private detective. He was with Tom when... when it happened. Oh? I was hired as a bodyguard and bungled the job. Now it's myself I'm investigating. Oh, these things are so difficult to believe. What could have happened? I've got a couple of notions. Would you like to help me work them out? Oh, I'm afraid I... I wouldn't make a good detective, Mr. Marlowe, and I'm... Yeah, I know, I know. You're inaccessible. The police told me to keep away from you. You look harmless to me. I'll be very glad to arrange an interview. Just leave your number with Mrs. Gray. Well, don't go to any special trouble. I'll bring my own crystal ball. Hey, how do you get out of this fun house? I was home that night trying to add things up. Moose Malloy, Marriott, Helen the Beautiful Blonde, and Jules Amthor. I put it all together and it just thumbed its nose at me. I decided to go down to Florian's cafe and split an infinitive when the boss, when the buzzer, changed my plans. I had a visitor, Helen Graham. I just dropped in because I thought you'd be interested in what Amthor had to say. Oh, and here. Shall we call this a retainer? Yeah, let's call it a retainer. Mr. Marlowe, do the police know about me? Would that bother you? Well, my husband has a morbid fear of publicity, and, and he's not at all well. Oh, I'll manage it. Now, about Amthor. Oh, please. I don't like being rushed. I was hoping we could go out somewhere. Do you like the Coconut Beach Club? I've never been there. I'm the drive-in type. <laughs> <laughs> the lights there are very flattering. They'd even mellow you a little, I think. But it's the sort of a place where you're expected to wear shoes and a tie. Mm. I'll be right with you. We went to the Coconut Beach Club. We had a table in the corner. She gave me that dreamy smile and started asking questions. You know, you've got a nice build for a private detective. Oh, it gets me around. How does one get to be a private detective? <laughs> you don't mind my sizing you up a little? Well, most of us are ex-cops. I worked for the district attorney. Got canned. Surely not for incompetence. Uh, for talking back. I had an interesting childhood, too, but you didn't drop in on me to get a biography. You'd rather I talked about Amthor. That's right, a good guess. Well, then, stay right here. I've got to powder my nose, and then I'll tell you all about it. Well, just be back before I get stuck with a check. Mr. Marlowe, I'd 
like to talk with you. Well, hello, Miss Gale. I'd like to talk to you, too, but not now. Do the Grails always hold their family reunions here? It won't take long, what I have to say. Look, honey, I've already got a date. She'll be right back, and I don't want you two slugging it out in public. There's no danger of that. She won't be back. How do you know? Never mind. What did Helen ask you to do? She wanted me to kiss her and find her jade necklace. I may have the order wrong, but that's the general idea. Well, whatever she was willing to pay you, I'll pay you more. Just stay away from her. Why do you look at me like that? I don't know. I seem to remember you from one of my better dreams. You, you, you know, if I... Now what are you looking at? I'll be right back. Uh, hello, Mr. Malloy. Do you like this place better than Florian's? This the babe. I got something for you to do. Look, look, I'm a big boy now. Don't you want me to have any fun at all? I want you should meet a guy. Will you let go of me? Another ten seconds and gangrene will set in these fingers. Thanks. Okay, I'll ditch the babe. I couldn't ditch the babe. The babe had ditched me. First Helen had disappeared, and now Anne. Anne had left a card on the table. She'd written on it, I'll keep the offer open. I don't live in Brentwood. My address is 962 North Hoover Street. Moose saw me put the card in my pocket. He came over and hustled me out to the curb. There was a car waiting, also a guy to drive the car. He took us to a very ritzy apartment house, showed us up to the penthouse, and then did something that made me rather unhappy. You, uh, you carry a gun, Pally? Oh, I'm so used to packing one that hardly notices on me. I think maybe I better hold it, eh? Stop the stalling. Let's get inside. He was there, all right, Mr. Amthor. Me and Moose got him. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Amthor, I'd like to, uh, to ask him about Velma. Don't be impatient. You and Michael wait in the other room. Come on, big boy. <laughs> but you ask him quick. I want to know now. Where did, well, you, where did you pick up Moose Malloy? We uh, met at Mrs. Grail's. You said you wanted an interview. Huh? I must insist upon some sort of logical progression. We'll come to Moose Malloy later. As for my profession, my patients regard me highly as a psychic consultant, Mr. Marlowe. Years ahead of my time. Which might be one way of saying that some folks have made some complaints to the cops. It might be. Do you have another theory about me? Yeah, yeah, I do, and it goes like this. Marriott blackmailed rich women, but somebody else found the women for him. Oh. Well, if you're right, I would be that somebody... And I would have Mrs. Grail's jade necklace, wouldn't I? Unless something went wrong. Like Marriott losing his nerve and ringing in a private dick. A sucker who'd risk his neck for a C-note. But who might figure a jade necklace would be a nice thing to have in his bank. And would this hypothetical detective be willing to part with it for a consideration? Could be, if he had it. How much of a consideration? Well, it's difficult to say until he produces the jade... He might be bluffing, trying to gain information. In which case, a great psychic, uh, years ahead of his time, might try to beat the truth out of him. You wouldn't suggest that? Only if you wanted to wear your face backwards for a while. No, no, there's no need for us to be at each other's throats, Mr. Marlowe. And there's really no need for subterfuge. Putting it on the simplest and friendliest terms. I want that jade. I suppose I don't have it. I suppose I don't want to sell. You got him to tell you yet? No, Malloy. I asked him where Velma is. He refuses to tell me. Now, wait a minute. I don't like you to not tell me where you got Velma. Well, if Amthor told you I know where Velma Valento is, he's nuts. He just picked you up to do his dirty work. I gave you some dough to find her. Well, keep your shirt on and stop dancing me around. He's lying, Malloy. He knows. Where you got her? I haven't got her, you dimwit. You shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have hit me. All right, now, the two of you. Stay just where you are. What do you got to pull a gun for? Where's that necklace, Marlowe? If you tell me, I can stop Moose. I don't know. Very well, Moose. He's yours. Make him talk. So Moose went to work. Those fingers went around my throat tighter and tighter. That black pool opened up at my feet again, and I dived in. The rest of it was a crazy, cold-cut dream. I was going somewhere. I'd never been there before. I was drugged. Somebody had thrown me full of juice. I was in the land of poppies, and I met a lot of interesting people. Necklace, Mr. Marlowe. Where is the necklace? I'm all right. What happened? I'm all right. You should have hit me like that. You should have hit me. Because I trust some people, I trust you. Because I trust some people. Help. Somebody help. 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 Help.
Yeah. Yeah. Smoke. Smoke. Rooms for smoke. I don't see no smoke. You want, I should blow it away. Uh, where am I? Anything else you'd like to know? Yeah. Yeah. The doors are too small. Stairs are made of dough. I don't see no stairs. I think the guy is nuts. Do you think he's nuts? Oh, uh, skip it. Yeah. I want to go to sleep. I want to sleep again. Better make it just that. Then I knew I couldn't go to sleep. Not if I wanted to stay alive. I could still feel those fingers on my throat. I even saw them. Just a bunch of bananas that looked like fingers. I wonder what I was full of. Something to keep me quiet, or was I dope to make me talk? Maybe both. Okay, Marlo, I said to myself, you're a tough guy. You've been sapped, choked, and shot in the arm till you're crazy as a couple of waltz and mice. But you got to get up and start moving. Let's see you do something really tough, like putting on your pants. Well, I made it. Okay, you cuckoo. Your pants are on, now walk. And talk. What about? Anything, everything. Just talk and keep walking. You're getting out of here. Walk! I walked, I don't know how long. That kind of time they don't make in a watch. And then the smoke went away. The room turned into a room, and I knew I was ready to talk to somebody. I tore the bed apart and... Got a hunk of bed spring, and then I started to shout again. Help! Help! Mike walked in again, and I let him have it. Oh, that was a nice feeling. I crept down the stairs. There was a man in an office. The doctor's office, it looked like. I was in front of him before he saw me. But his hand went for the buzzer right away. That buzzer won't buy anything tonight, Doc. I just gave Nursey a sleeping tablet. For three days, sir, you have been a very sick man. Three days? You're swaying right now. Don't you realize that? I'm, I'm all cured, Doc. Now, what were you saying? I made no remark. I thought I heard you saying that you had a gun in that desk. And that if, that if you were very careful, you could sneak it out. A very stupid thing to do, Mr. Milo. Ah, uh, a gun. It's better. Now, talk some more. You've been suffering from narcotic poisoning. On account of you pumped me full of it. Speak up, Dr. Jekyll. I'm in a wild mood tonight. I haven't shot a man in a week. You very nearly died, sir. I had to give you digitalis. Also a little something to make me talk. What was I supposed to talk about? Maybe a jade necklace I haven't got? Mr. Amthor will be disappointed in you again. Never disappoint Mr. Amthor, Doc. It depresses him. I'm warning you, Mr. Marlowe. At any moment, you'll collapse. I must insist on your going back to bed. Get away from me. The gun, please. I want that gun. You're going to faint, Mr. Marlowe. Maybe you're right. Maybe you're right, but not on this carpet. I'll do my folding on a nice hard seat. You'll never reach that door. Well, before I try, I'm going to rip something off. No, not your head. Just the telephone. So long, Doc. I'll look you up when I get insomnia again. I staggered out to the street and down to the corner... Then I thought I was seeing things again. Yep, there he was, Moose Malloy. I couldn't have knocked the ashes off a cigarette, but I tried to swing on him. He just held me up and started talking. You should not to fight with me. You ain't in such good shape. Well, I'll, I'll murder you. I don't like to fight with nobody. I want for you to keep looking for Velma. Who planted you here, Amthor? Amthor tells me about you. But he was kidding all the time. Uh, he was kidding the pants off you, Buster. He doesn't want you to find your girl. Nobody's supposed to find Velma. He's got other plans. You ain't in such good shape. I'd better help you. Then get me a cab, you dopey gorilla. Where do you want to go? What's that card you got? It says 962 North Hoover Street on the card. You saw me pick up this card in the Coconut Beach Club. That's where the babe lives, huh? Yeah, I think I'll find out why she's living alone and if she really likes it. Now get me a cab. What do you want? Black coffee, Miss Grail. Eggs and a scotch and soda. You're drunk. You better get out before... Hey, this is a nice place here. Is there room for you in the Brentwood Palace, or don't you like it out there? Why did you come here? Because the cops may be looking for me, and I'm not ready to talk. You're not drunk. Why do you look the way you do? Yeah, ask the second Mrs. Grail. She fixed up a blind date for me with Jules Amthor and a couple of his whipping boys. What happened? 
Are you all right? Uh, I don't think I'm supposed to be alive. Um, say that again. Say what again? The last thing you said. I said, what happened? Are you all right? Miss Grail, what were you doing out there in the canyon the night Marriott was killed? I was lying on my face when somebody threw a flashlight and asked me if I was all right. And then she said, what happened? Yeah, a girl with red hair and a crooked nose and a nice figure. Yes, a girl named Ann Grail. I didn't kill Marriott. You weren't out there just taking a hike. I didn't kill him. I'd say you overheard Marriott and your stepmother making some sort of arrangements about the jade. What if I did? You knew Marriott had been holding hands with her and you didn't like that. I hate her. And you hated him, too. You hated anybody that had anything to do with Helen, so you bumped him off. You killed Tom Marriott. I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't. <laughs> We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. A brief intermission before our stars return in the third act of Murder, My Sweet. Meanwhile, it's 2.45 of a bright afternoon, just the day for Mary to be hard at work in her victory garden. There, that'll hold those pesky weeds for a while. Hello, Johnny. Telegram for me? What in the world? At 48-hour past, arriving 5.15. See you soon, darling. Sign Jim. Oh, heavens to Betsy. He'll be here in a few hours. I'd die if he saw me like this. The house has got to be slicked up, too, and I've just got to fix something special for dinner. Well... Here goes. Got to work fast. Now it's 3.45. Mary has accomplished wonders. Is giving the furniture one last polish. There. That looks something like it. And now to press my dress. The blue and green print Jim loves so. Now it's 4.45. The dress is ready, the dinner started, and there's still a half an hour to go. Oh, goodness, I feel all in. Glad there's time for my Lux Soap beauty bath. That'll do the trick. Hmm, this lather's wonderful. So rich and creamy. I feel like a different person already. And I love this nice perfume Lux Soap leaves on my skin. Makes me forget all the work I've done and feel like Jim's girl again. And now it's 5.30 and Jim is here. Gosh, you're lovely, Mary. What makes you so sweet? So many clever girls depend on their Lux Toilet Soap Beauty Bath for a quick, refreshing beauty pickup. But most important of all, they know this secret. When I step for my Lux Soap Bath, I know my skin is fresh and really sweet. Screen Stars say a daily Lux Soap Bath makes you sure of daintiness. And I found they're right. Screen Stars, lovely women everywhere, discovered long ago their fine white complexion soap, Lux Toilet Soap, makes an exquisite bath soap, too. The extra creamy lather, rich and abundant even in hard water, leaves skin flower fresh. And Screen Stars tell you they love Lux Toilet Soap's delicate clinging perfume, too. Why not get some of Hollywood's fragrant Lux Toilet Soap for your beauty bath tomorrow? It's thrifty to use. You'll find each satin smooth cake lasts and lasts. Back now to Irving Pitchell and our stars. The curtain rises on Act Three of Murder, My Sweet, starring Dick Powell as Philip Marlowe, Claire Trevor as Helen, June Dupre as Anne, and Mike Mazurki as Moose Malloy. Philip Marlowe is in the apartment of Anne Grail, whom he has just accused of murder. <laughs> I stood there in Ann Grail's apartment and accused her of killing Marriott. I was sure she hadn't done it, but I had to find out what she knew. I knew just what you're thinking. If I didn't kill him, my father did. And if he did, you'd do anything to protect him? No. No, he couldn't do such a thing. Uh, I, don't, I don't buy it either yet. I was just trying it on for size. Won't you please go home? I, I'm expecting a date. I, I can't go home. There's a very stubborn character named Inspector Randall. And if he isn't on my doorstep right now waiting to pick me up, then two of his stooges are. So relax. It... Hey, your date? Probably. Wait here. Tell him you've decided to have a quiet little supper with me. Yes? My name is Randall. I'd like a word with your partner. Oh, I was just talking about you, Inspector. I've been looking for you for three days. Pull up a chair. Mr. Grail was about to fix some soft-boiled eggs and scotch. You wouldn't join us. Last time I saw you, I gave you some good advice. I guess it didn't take, huh? I didn't bother Amthor. I was going to, but he didn't get around to it. He got to me. Yeah, he gave me quite a party. How'd it go? 
What'll it buy me? This is straight, Randall. You'd like to get Amthor, and I'd like to help you. He annoyed me a little. I'm listening. Well, Amthor's a tough turkey. He works some kind of blackmail routine on dames who come to him with problems. I think Marriott was his contact man. Let's get to the new part, huh? Uh, the jewelry Marriott was after was a jade necklace that belonged to one of Amthor's patients. Well, Marriott fumbled the ball. Yeah? So Amthor figured I had it. He sent me to a little rest home where the teacher to talk. There's a guy there who's a whiz with a hypo. The address is 23rd and Descanso. Okay, okay. Who owns the jade? I told you. One of Amthor's patients. By the name of, uh... I don't know. Oh, Miss Grail. Yes? When were you last to your father's place in Brentwood? Not for several days. Is something wrong? Skip it, skip it. Milo, I figure what you told me is on the level. But don't make a habit of trying to help me. I might get grateful and lock you up. Uh, give me a call tomorrow. How could he know about me? I don't know. That's what happens when you let a cop go to school. He gets smart. Now fix up your face. We, we got to get out of the marble quarry. Where? Brentwood. Oh. What's the matter? Oh, it's a funny thing. About every third day I get hungry. I, I can fix eggs and coffee if you want to wait. You know, you're crazy. Everybody takes a poke at you. They fill, it, fill you full of drugs, but you bounce right back and hit between tackle and land all over again. And I don't think you even know which team you're on. No, I don't know which team anybody's on. I don't even know who's playing today. At Brentwood, we saw Mr. Grail, and I've seen healthier-looking gents in the county morgue. His face was gray with worry. Something was eating him. More important than a missing jade necklace. A missing wife. Helen left yesterday. I haven't heard from her since. And have you seen her? Have you? No, dear, but maybe... Well, maybe she went to the beach house. Beach house? It had been rented to Marriott indirectly through the bank. I think I'd better have a look at it. This whole thing has gone too far. Oh? Or maybe it's coming too close to home. Mr. Grail, I don't say you killed Marriott, but you could have, for a good old-fashioned motive. I did not kill him, Mr. Morrow, but I say it is better that he is dead. I'm not concerned if the police suspect me. I'm concerned about my wife. I, I'm losing her. Father. And that is please. why I say all this has got to stop. You'll drop the case, Mr. Morrow. I'll pay you well. Oh, fine. I get dragged in, get money shoved at me. I get pushed out, get money shoved at me. Everybody pushes me in, everybody pushes me out. Nobody wants me to do anything. Okay, skip it. I'll put a check in the mail. Yeah, well, I cost a lot to do nothing. I get restless. Throw on a trip to Mexico. Father, where are you... Stay here. Why? Because I want a key to that beach house. But you just told him. I can't stop now. Do the cops stop? Does Helen stop? Do you stop? What do you mean, does, does Helen stop? Oh, I don't know. If I always knew what I meant, it'd be a genius. You're vicious. You get some horrible satisfaction seeing people torn apart. Sister, you're hanging on to something that's going to smack you hard. If I stick, it smacks you sooner, sooner and cleaner. Maybe that's why I'm sticking. Oh, but I'd stick anyway, because a guy who hired me got killed. I'll... I'll get you the key. We went to the beach house. Things happened there. Some of them I can explain. One thing I can't. After we took a, lo took a look around, Anne and I were standing there in the dark, looking out that big front window toward the ocean, and before I knew it, we were in a clinch. Oh, it's nice to kiss a girl like Anne Grail. I told her she had a cute little face, even if her nose was slightly crooked. It isn't crooked. It just has a bump on it where I got hit with a baseball. I used to play shortstop. Philip. Yeah? What about my father? If we don't find I'm Helen... I'm going to make you mad now, baby. But here goes. Your father really loves Helen. When I came along, you were afraid she might turn me into another Marriott. So you tried to buy me off. That didn't work, and I began to suspect your father. A real tough guesser might say that when he couldn't buy me off either, you decided to be nice to me. Like just now. There's nothing decent about you, is there? Nothing at all. I, I don't always guess right. I, I may be wrong. I, I think I am wrong. Sometimes I hate all men. Young men, handsome men who don't work for a living and, and almost heels who are private detectives. <laughs> Helen! Oh, I'm sorry, darling. But you should know by now that men play rough. They soften you up and then they belt you one. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Marlowe. Hi. I didn't finish, Helen. 
I hate a lot of women, too. Especially beautiful, expensive blondes. All bubble baths and moonlight. And, and inside, cold and hard like blue steel. Only not that clean. Your slip is showing, darling. I'm leaving. I'll tell Father you're here. Well, how long have you been here, Mrs. Grail? Since yesterday. You just happened to leave the Brentwood place before the cops dropped on your husband? Oh, please. Look, you hired me to get your necklace, so you stand me up at a corny rum joint and tell Amthor. I'm sorry. I, I thought you might have had the jade. Please, please don't blame me. You could have had it. What Amthor did, was it bad? Uh, it almost made me mad. No. <laughs> now, just what goes between you two? Well, he's blackmailing me. Well, that much even I can figure out. My husband is in love with me. I'm, I'm fond of him, and I'm grateful, but I find other men very attractive. I imagine they meet you halfway. <laughs> I met Amthor through Tom Marriott. He's smart. He does know psychology. He got me talking, and of course I talked too much. He uncovered something, and the blackmailing started. I think if my husband had found out, it would have killed him. So you agreed to give Amthor the necklace? But before I could, it was stolen. By Marriott? Must have been. Amthor probably came to the same conclusion. He decided to kill him, and that's why Marriott wanted you for protection. All right, I'll, I'll buy it up to there. What happens now? I want you to help me kill Jules Amthor. Don't you see? You're the only one I can turn to. It's the only way I'll ever have peace. He'll never be satisfied, even if he does get the jade. Why me? Because I have a gun or just because I wear pants? Oh, please. Please, I need you so. I need help and peace desperately. I need you. Have you got anything worked out? Yes, but Ampho has disappeared. Maybe I can find him. Well, then tell him you've got the jade and you're ready to sail. Then what? Well, that's my part. All right, uh... I'll dig him up. Oh, you're... You're wonderful. How would you like not having to earn a living? Wouldn't bother me a bit. <laughs> when will you be back? Uh, I may have a time finding him. Maybe not till tomorrow night. Oh, would you mind kissing me goodbye? No, Please. I wouldn't mind at all. I went straight to Amthor's apartment. I had a couple of keys, and one of them fitted the back door. I wanted to surprise Amthor. I thought it would give him a bang. I thought it would kill him. Amthor was on the living room floor. He wasn't must, just snapped, the way a pretty girl would snap a stalk of celery. Only for this job, you'd have to be a big man with a big pair of hands. I hustled downtown, bought a late edition. I wanted to see how the police were doing on the Marriott murder. And while I was looking at the paper, somebody was looking at me. I've been trying to find you all over. I got to go away. Yeah, yeah, Amthor's dead. I know, you didn't mean to kill him. You just shook him too hard because you wouldn't tell you where Velma is. You find her? Yeah, Moose, I find her. Where is she? You took the Johns off on her. I wouldn't want little Velma to do no stretch. Turn me loose, turn me loose, and stop waltzing me around. If the Johns got Velma... Nobody's got her, she's got herself. Yeah, you can see her tomorrow. Okay. Now go hide yourself and be here tomorrow night as soon as it gets dark. Moose showed up tonight like I told him. I sold him on waiting outside the beach house until I called him. That was like lighting a stick of dynamite and telling it not to go off. But I had a plan. Helen was waiting for him. Philip, Philip, did you find him? Did you find Amthor? He'll be here around 12. 12. Would you like to look at this? Hmm? This is it, Philip. The necklace. Where'd you get it? I went to Brentwood today. Got it out of my dressing table drawer. Surprise. In a flabbergasted sort of way, yes. It was never stolen. You faked the whole thing? I simply wasn't going to let Amthor get it. When he comes, he can take a look at it. Well, he, he may have a gun. He'll never get that far. So have I. You went to Brentwood. Then where's Anne and your father? I can't say. They were out. And now I'm going to be very grateful. Here, the necklace. It's yours. You're much too nice to be a grubby detective all your life. You told Marriott this thing had been stolen. Why? Well, he was close to Amthor. They both had to think it was stolen. Marriott fell for that? Of course. And you still think Amthor killed him? Who else? You. Oh, no. No, you, you can't mean that. Yes, I think Marriott was scared because he'd agreed to help you kill a nosy detective. 
The same detective Moose took to Florian's joint, the one Florian told Marriott about. Marriott had to help you protect his interest. You knew that. You were a living to him and to Amther and, his, and in his modest way to Florian. You supported them. They knew you wouldn't be worth blackmailing if I found you for Moose Malloy. Oh, no, no, oh, I was nifty thinking, darling. At the canyon, one of us would get out of the car. It didn't matter who. Either way, you had Marriott and me separated, and you would tag us one at a time and get your 8,000 bucks and knock off Amthor later. Yeah, it might have worked, too, if it hadn't been for Ann chasing down there after you. Of course, my head's pretty hard. It's true. It's all true. Everybody was closing in on me. I didn't know which way to turn. And it almost worked, sister. I was almost as dead as Marriott. But killing a man with a blackjack, oh, that's no work for a lady. Well, after, after it happened, I, I didn't know what you would do. But now I'm, I'm so close to peace. So close. Just, just Amthor. But I can't face it alone. Don't desert me now. Sure. Amthor blackmailed you. He's got something on you, only it isn't what you told me. It isn't just men. Your husband could understand the men. No, it's the clink looming up. And it's no good understanding the clink. Moose is looking for you, Velma. Where is he? Where is Moose? Waiting for me to call him in. Eight years ago, when you were his girl, what did you talk Moose into doing? He went to jail for you. Was it murder or something serious? Where are you going? To tell him that his red head has turned blonde. Come back. Huh? Oh. Oh, a gun. Well, well, it fits your personality better than a blackjack. And the pearl handle goes swell with your fingernail polish. You know, it's too bad it has to be like this. Don't move. Who is it? Well, well, come in, come in. Hello. Darling, that gun, what are you... Close that door, Anne. Your timing, dear, gets worse and worse. We've been listening. Why didn't you tell me you were in such trouble? I wanted to spare you. I might have been able to prevent all this. Now, of course, it's too late, Mr. Marlowe. I see your point. Helen, if Mr. Amthor is coming, I think perhaps you'd better do it quickly. Father! Get inside, dear. Keep your hands up, Mr. Marlowe. I'll have to take your gun. I'll be with Anne, Helen. Oh, all by ourselves again. Yes. You know, this will be the first time I ever killed anyone I knew so little about and like so much. You and I, just a couple of mugs. But we could have got along. What's stopping us now? I can handle Moose. He broke Amthor's neck yesterday. What did you say? Something I shouldn't have. Amthor is dead. Yeah? Then that leaves only you. I'm sorry, but you know too... <laughs> Too... too much. I had to do it, Mr. Marlow. I had to kill her. Hello, hello. Let's have the police. Give me that phone. Give it to me. Don't you realize he saved your life? Why must you suffer for that? The cops always like to solve murders done with my gun. She's dead, isn't that enough? She was evil, all evil. I think I hear a shot, Mr. Marlow. I think I better come in. Moose. Moose, it didn't work out the way I planned. Never mind. I'd like to talk to Velma now. I'd... Moose. Don't touch her. She ain't hardly changed. Just like always. Cute as a bug's ear. I wasn't going to bother her none. She done all right? Who done this? I did. You shouldn't have killed her. Moose. You shouldn't have killed Velma. Moose. Get out of my way. Don't come any closer, please. Moose, will you listen to me? Moose! That old black pit opened up again right on schedule. Blacker than the others and deeper. Well, that's the works. That's all I know on account I didn't see so well with my eyeballs scorched. They didn't keep me long at the hospital. Two hours ago, Randall came and picked me up. And everything I've been telling you, I've been telling him. He's sitting right here in front of me now. I wish I could see Randall. Wish the bandage wasn't on my face. I want to look at his ugly kisser and figure what he's thinking. Marlo? Huh? There's a piece of paper here on my desk, a warrant for your arrest. I'm tearing it up. Oh, thanks. Uh, Tonight, uh, when it happened, I I heard the shots. I still don't know who got hit. It wasn't the kid, was it, Randall? No. No, you can get out of here now if you want to. You mean I'm sprung? Who backed me up? Who got shot? I heard three. Moose Malloy. Dead? Yes, and Grail. While they were fighting for the gun. Anne's okay, then. Huh. 
She thought it over while I was in the hospital and came around and backed me up, right? I didn't say. <laughs> McNulty, see if he gets home. Yeah. I'll buy you a ride in a cab, Marlo. Hey, what are you putting in my pocket? The necklace. She gave it to you, didn't she? Yeah, I tried it on. It's wrong for my complexion. Then give it to your girlfriend. Strangle yourself with it. No, just go on, beat it. Let's go, Marlo. Well, you can come in now, Miss Grail. Why didn't you tell him? Why did you have to keep him guessing? About your backing him up? Why don't you tell him? You can catch him outside. Just give Nolly the high sign. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hey, nothing. Yeah? What do you know about that redhead pitching for me? Uh, uh, yeah. Hey, are we alone or am I hearing things? What things? Like someone else is walking with us. Oh, you're on the street. Lots of people walk on the street. Oh. oh. Hmm. She had a cute figure, huh? I, I didn't notice. Hmm. You must be low on vitamins. <laughs> oh, she had more than a figure, too. Not a beautiful face, but a good face. Uh, I didn't notice. Mm, face like a Sunday school picnic. Oh, there's a cab down the block. Say, are you sure we're alone? Hey, hey, cab. Yes, sir. Oh, well, I guess she thought I liked the blonde chewing on my face. Wish I could tell her. I wish I could... Duck your head, Marlowe. This here's the cab. Where to, mister? 800 South Kingsley. Yes, sir. Hey, Nalty, I... Hey, what goes? If I didn't have these bandages over my eyes... You go to the same address, too, lady? Uh, Nalty, I haven't kissed anybody in a long time. Would it be all right if I kissed you, Nalty? I think it would be just fine. I said, are you going to the same... Oh. Oh, yeah, I guess you are. <laughs> now that we've cleared Dick Powell of murder... The rest of our cast can get back on their feet and join him at the footlights for a curtain call. You should have been in tonight's cast, Irving. You used to play in pictures. Well, thanks, Dick. But I'm too old to go through what you went through in tonight's play. Tell me, Claire, how does it happen that a nice girl like you always gets to play the bad girl roles? Oh, I don't know, Irving. I guess they've got me typed. They had Dick Powell typed for a while, but look what he's doing now. That's right, June. Next week, he starts a whole new radio series as a tough detective. You mean I might yet get a chance to play a sweet young housewife? And how about me, Mr. Pitchell? Do you think I could play Hansel and Gretel with Margaret O'Brien? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if you took a course in compression, Mike. You mean expression? No, I mean compression. Or else learn to walk on your knees and keep your hands behind your back. <laughs> uh, well, what do we do with June Dupre, Irving? Well, we just pat her on both cheeks and tell her to stay as sweet as she is. Oh, now, here, you aren't falling for that Lux complexion, Pitch. Why not? Other men have. That's right, Irving. That's why so many of us use Lux toilet soap. Look, uh, Pitch, while we're getting everybody out of acting ruts, what, uh, what sort of a role would you give yourself if you went back to acting? Well, you were mostly a heavy in pictures, weren't you? Yes, and I rather fancy myself in a light musical comedy part. You know, the kind of bright young chap who sings, Smile the while, the smile be your style. You <laughs> Look, Irving, I, I think you'd better stick to making pictures. Incidentally, I understand from Paramount that you did great things with a medal for Benny. Well, I had a good story there to work with, Dick. A homeboy whose rival in love is an overseas hero. And a good cast. I'm looking forward to it, Irving. But uh, tell me, what do you have on Lux next week? Well, for next week, we have an altogether charming story with a most delightful cast. The Canterville Ghost, starring Margaret O'Brien, Charles Lawton, and Tom Drake. Take a group of high-spirited American commandos, billet them in an ancient British castle where their hostess is Lady Margaret O'Brien, and then haunt that castle by the most notorious ghost in England, and you have the elements of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer's entertaining and extraordinary comedy. The Canterville Ghost can haunt my house next Monday, Pitch. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. And all our thanks. This week, America salutes the Army's famous Quartermaster Corps on its 107th anniversary. The oldest supply branch of the armed forces, the Fighting Quartermasters, are seeing to it that American soldiers are the best fed, best clothed, best cared for fighting men in history. Theirs has been a gallant contribution to the cause of freedom. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, 
Join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Lawton, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake in the Canterville Ghost. This is Irving Pitchell saying good night from Hollywood. Every day, as the war against Japan increases in intensity, the need for waste fats and greases grows more critical. Here's one department where the enemy may be superior unless you help make up the difference from your kitchens. Save all waste fats and greases, no matter how discolored. Keep a clean can in which to strain them and take them regularly to your butcher. Remember, for every pound, he'll give you four cents plus two extra meat points. Murder, My Sweet was presented through the cooperation of RKO Studios, producers of Enchanted Cottage. Dick Powell appeared through the courtesy of the Fitch Bandwagon and will shortly be seen in the RKO picture, Cornered. Claire Trevor will soon appear in RKO's Johnny Angel. Mike Mazurki is currently working on the RKO version of Dick Tracy. Heard in tonight's cast were Cy Kendall, Gerald Moore, Robert Regent, Norman Field, Eddie Marr, Dora Singleton, Charles Seal, Ed Emerson, and Leo Sharon. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our fighting forces overseas through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day. See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent Program. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Pepsodent presents Philip Marlowe, Hollywood's famous private detective created by Raymond Chandler. Philip Marlowe, tough, cynical, private eye of Murder, My Sweet, the sardonic, case-hardened detective of the Brasher Doubloon, the Lady in the Lake, and the Big Sleep. You've seen him in action in all of those top-flight mystery pictures. Now, in order that you may continue to enjoy this exciting mystery series, Pepsodent brings you The Adventures of Philip Marlowe on the air with a cast of noted radio players and starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with Irium. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. It's the three-to-one favorite over all other toothpastes. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is the favorite three-to-one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with other toothpastes at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three to one over all other brands they tried. These families, three to one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Sanguis that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair, make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends up in a fight, and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I opened the door and closed it from the outside and locked it and went out to get a beer before I went up to my apartment. Uh, fill her up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlowe. Marlowe. Marlin is a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Hey. Hey, you bartender. Come in on the ride. That uh, drunk again. What'd you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Make it snappy, yeah. Be right with you, sport. I gotta draw this man a beer. 
Crying out loud, these stumble bums have come in here. You got another customer, Bacchus. Hey, bud. You seen a lady in here lately? A lady? Tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Nobody like that's been in. All right, straight scotch, fast. I left my engine running out there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This slick-looking, sarcastic guy stepped up to the bar and drank his scotch whole. And he stopped. The drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke curled. Very little. All right, you other guys. Don't move. So long, Waldo. All right, don't move, you two. Oh, Waldo. But I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. All right, get on that phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Holy smoke. Not too late. Drove away with this dead guy's car. Uh, Maybe he ain't dead. He's dead, all right. Where's your phone? This is for the police. The prowl car boys were there in about five minutes. Waldo was out of business, all right. And nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's tall, brown-haired pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about nine o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a tall, brown-haired pretty girl in a bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Oh, excuse me. Just a minute, lady. I said, excuse me, I'm in a hurry. Now, if you'll be good enough Look, to step out Look, you better out of... not go outside in those clothes. Just what do you mean by telling me this what... This isn't a make. You're in trouble. Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you in those clothes. But I haven't done anything that... I'm in room 41 across the hall. Now, I never collected an etching in my life. All right, I'll go with you. I'll go. I got to my room and rustled up some scotch and soda and brought the girl her glass. She had a small automatic in her hand. It jumped up at me. And her eyes were full of panic. I put down both glasses on the table slowly so that I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, maybe this wind has got you crazy, too. Don't move. Be careful, don't move. A man just got shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket like yours. What did he look like, this man? Tall, 5'11", slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter, dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you earlier tonight to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? Used to be my chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? Why? Listen, he asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell them. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal. Fifteen thousand dollars. Oh, it's peanuts. But it wasn't the value. It meant something to me. The man I love gave it to me, and now he's dead. He was a flyer shot down over Germany. I'll go back and tell my husband that. He probably hired you. He did? Well, how much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. He's a hydroelectric engineer. I'll have you know that my husband oh, is one of the... Oh, skip it. I'll take him out to lunch sometime and have him tell me himself. And about Waldo. Whatever he had on you is dead stock now, like Waldo himself. You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, sister, he's dead. Dead, dead, dead. Lady, he is dead. Oh. I right, scream and I'll give you two black eyes. I'm not going to scream. Who will that be? There's a dressing room behind that door. Hide there. I don't now, don't argue with me, do I? It's all right. And I went to the door, making a loud, yawning sound. The backs of my hands were wet. I opened the door. Without a gun, that was a mistake. 
I certainly knew the gun I was looking into, a 22 target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head and the flat, shiny eyes and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I, I backed into the room, and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan pen. How is he? Dead. <laughs> I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeeper and me talking. I told him my name, where I lived. That's how, pal. I said, why? Oh, skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. Oh, you're pretty tough at that, ain't you? But you're slamming off, pal. All right, but you could get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else. Oh, yeah, sure. Is this better? Is this such all right? Uh, just so it is in my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun. The door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her iris. She, she was scared. She had her gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She'd try to make the door scream either way. It'd be curtains for both of us. You scared, mister? You worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Baldy, and her horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Go on, say the word. Well, don't take all night about it if you're if you're going to do something about it. Why not, pal? I like this. I suppose I yell. Go ahead, yell. Go ahead. Put up yeah. your hands! Hey, look! Oh. Thanks, sister. Thanks. That that buys me. Everything I have is yours now and forever. Is he dead? You flatter me no end, lady. I only punched him. All right, now get out of here while I call the cops down on this killer. Yes. yes. Good night. Good hey, night. Hey, wait, wait. Leave that Bolero jacket here. It mocks you for the cops. Oh, yes. Here. Okay. See you again? Why? Oh, I don't know. No, I guess not. After all, who am I to be the rival of a dead flyer? I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. <laughs> Yeah? You mean me? Yes. Please. Oh, you. Again, huh? Sit in. I must talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters, huh? Yes. Well, I went down there with the law and gave them the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thank you. You saved my life, so no one knows a thing about you. Well, incidentally, neither do I. Well, my name is Mrs. Frank Bosley. 212 Fremont Place, Olympia 24596. Is that what you want? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, why did you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Pearls? Yes. Pearls, too? All right. Tell me about the pearls. We've had a murder and a beautiful mystery woman and a sadistic killer and a heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets, and there weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? Uh, it's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do in this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? He moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Mm, great, a sort of an amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, it's getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. Well, you could have brought him along. You could have sat in the back seat working out a problem in hydroelectrics while... Well, what? Well, I didn't have any answers. They wouldn't sound cheap or just ridiculous or from the sophomore class in repartee. 
I had an unlit cigarette in my hand. I threw it out of the window. I took a hold of her and kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. I wasn't always that way. Only since Johnny Dalmas was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them perfectly matched with a diamond propeller clasp. I'd have loved them if they'd been wooden beads because he gave them to me. I love Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand that? Hmm. What's your name? Lola. Lola, how did you explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband? I told him they were imitation, then I bought them myself. How did Walter latch on to them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina, Walter and I'd go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together, but that's all. But you confided in Waldo about those pearls. I was a fool. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you, or he'd tell Papa, huh? I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment? I suppose it's a lot to ask. No, sweetheart, huh? I've been paid. I'll go look. Wait here, huh? Is the gun long, Lola? No. Well? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. A man? Who? You know a man named Leon Balsanos? Not by name. I don't know. Mexican, South American, about uh, 45, small, iron gray hair, very neat, fawn-colored suit, wine-colored tie. No, I don't think I know such a man. Is he the one in Waldo's room? Yeah. What does he have to say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He's dead. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, with music composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. It's the three-to-one favorite over all other toothpastes. It's true. With families all over America, New Pepsodent is the favorite three-to-one. The Farrell family of Evergreen Park, Illinois, preferred New Pepsodent on every single count. The Farrells say... New Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer New Pepsodent over all other toothpaste they've tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say New Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Farrells and other families who compared New Pepsodent with other toothpaste they had at home. Get New Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler and starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro-Golden-Mare. Producers of the Technicolor musical Fiesta, starring Esther Williams. I sat with Lola Barsley in her car listening to that jittery, infuriating desert wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hands until they stopped trembling. Then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun and a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could use it. Someone? Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? It's been there for hours. 
It was there before I parked here to wait for you. Leon, the man in Waldo's room, came in that car, but according to the key containers he carried, that isn't his car. Whose car is it? Does it matter? Well, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the keys. A lady? Well, anyway, a woman, if you're going to split hairs. Eugenie Kolchenko. Hmm? In West Los Angeles? Never heard of her. Oh. Uh-huh. All right, well, you go home now, huh? What are you going to do? Drive that flossy convertible around, wave at my friends, impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. Yes? What is it, please? Miss uh, Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes? What is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Now, don't be alarmed. I found it and I brought it home to you. Come in, please. It is a reward you wish. Shall we say... Snap a... out of it, dragon lady. Who was he? Who was who? The little guy, Leon. You loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? <gasps> oh. oh, no, no. Oh, yes, yes. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, honey? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? The gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead. Darling, he's dead. Well, that's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Mm, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Mm-hmm. You told the police yet? Never do at once. What can be deferred pending negotiations? Aesop. I might negotiate. Oh, peachy. What do you know, Marlowe? A man named Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happened to have the inside as to who he was. And when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leo Valsanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 in 20s on him, would he? No, but this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed at that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Hmm. Is there a basis there for negotiations yet? Very well, Marlowe. I'm a married man. There were certain unpaid bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But you told me I might charge to your account. All right, so I wasn't very bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the unpaid bill safely in my briefcase. Somehow this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon and gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's dough and was forced to kill Leon in the process. Then he went out to keep another date and accidentally walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down. And someone still has those bills. And I'm in for a divorce suit. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it. Yeah, that could be. The cops caught him. Oh. And the police have the briefcase. Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crime, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. Look, I've got a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me. Well, then that's what it'll cost you. Well, good luck. And, um... Thank you, Mr. Uh... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? My name is Frank Barsley. Bars. Barsley. Oh. What does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer? Yeah. How did you know? My voices tell me. Who? Darling, this man is manifestly insane. It's the heat, Miss Kolchenk. It's the Santa Ana. It's the desert wind. May I use your telephone? <laughs> Someday I must tell you about Ibera. Salt of the Earth Ibera, detective lieutenant over at Central Homicide. I phoned Ibera from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibera time to check my tip and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room, only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Well, I thought Waldo might have them up there. Mm. Whose pearls were they? A lady's. Go on. Or they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Mm, yeah. What, yeah? They might have. 
Also a batch of unpaid bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Barsley? Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Well, now, the police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They, they want to prevent or to solve crime, right? So? So I've got $500 for the police fund if those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. <laughs> Quit your kidding. No, no, it's, it's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. That's it. 41 pearls, perfectly matched diamond propeller clasp. That's it. That's the one. Take it away, Morrow. On the level? Mm-hmm. Just tell me straight what it's all about, all oh, I ask. Sure, sure. Well, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills, guy by the name of Barsley. Well, Barsley sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo killed Leon, and then stepped out and happened to get shot by that guy at the bar. Now, if Barsley's name stays out of the paper, I get $500, and that goes to the police fund. We'll keep him out. Well, now, I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. As you say, Morrow, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Well, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, she no, lives no, at no, night. No, 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 uh, You better take them to her. You see, except for the diamond propeller clasp on them, they're, uh, they're phony. Phony, but... It... All but the clasp, Morrow. All but the clasp. <laughs> stared at Ibera. So the flyer, Johnny Dalmas, the great lover, had given Lola a string of fake pearls. Well, I didn't know how to tell her, but I called her up and told her to meet me at the beachcombers at two. I was going to slip her the bad news slowly. I'm glad you asked me to meet you here, Mr. Marlowe. See, I... I had to have someone to talk to. Go ahead. Go ahead, talk. I'm listening. Now, Mr. Marlowe, now more than ever, I must... I must have those pearls. Why? Money trouble? Oh, no, no. It's just that everything's gone wrong. And this morning, my husband told me where to separate. Oh, I'm sorry, Lola. But if I had Johnny's pearls, it would be a link with the past and with Johnny. And all he meant to me. It's how a woman feels, Mr. Marlowe. I wouldn't blame you for not understanding. Maybe I do, though. So please, Mr. Marlow, please. You'll try to find my pearls. Lola, look, I... Even if it isn't all of them. Any part of them. Any... Any single smallest one of them. It'll be Johnny's. Look, will you uh, meet me here again around four o'clock? I'll be here. Okay, I'll see what I can do. There was only one earthly decent thing I could do. I took Lola's glass pearls to a jeweler and I had him take off the diamond clasp and put it on one of those strings of so-called simulated pearls that they sell you for three bucks, tax included. Then I went back to keep my four o'clock date with Lola at the beachcombers. Well, Mr. Marlowe, anything new? Yes, the uh, police found some pearls in Waldo's car. They found my pearls? No, no, not not exactly. Not exactly? Well, Waldo was getting set to jip you, Lola. He had the diamond clasp of your necklace attached to a string of cheap imitations. And then he sold the real pearls. Oh, how... Oh. These are the imitations here. Yes. But it is my clasp. The clasp is real. Is that all right? Yes, it's the clasp that Johnny Dalmas gave me. Oh, of course, of course it's all right. Oh, that's well. Thank you so much, Mr. Marlowe. Forget it. I won't. Not ever. Well, it's this goodbye. Yeah, I think so. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas, Lola. If anybody ever bothers you again, though, well, let me know. Name's Philip Marlowe. <laughs> I drove almost to Malibu and then I parked and walked out on a rock cliff jutting into the Pacific Ocean. Then I reached in my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. The gull swooped down on them and then flapped up again, screaming indignantly. 
The phony pearls that fool Waldo and Lola Barsley, but they couldn't fool a seagull. I said to myself, to the memory of Johnny Dalmas, just another four flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once I realized that the wind had died, the Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the first of a new mystery series, Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Brought to you by the Lieber Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Have you tried, have you tasted the new Pepsodent toothpaste? Its lingering minty flavor is so fresh and inviting, families prefer it by an overwhelming average of three to one over all other toothpastes in a recent nationwide test. They said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, new Pepsodent gives you more invigorating irium foam. It sweeps dulling film away. No wonder it's the three-to-one favorite with families all over America. Get new Pepsodent with irium for your family right away. Tonight's story on the adventure of Philip Marlowe is based on Red Wind, written by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger. Heard with Van Heflin was Loreen Tuttle as Lola Barsley. And this is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at this same time to another exciting story on The Adventures of Philip Barlow, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. For the safety of your smile, use Pepsodent twice a day See your dentist twice a year. Lever Brothers Company presents the Pepsodent Program, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective, created by Raymond Chandler, brought to you on the air by Pepsodent, and starring MGM's brilliant and dynamic young actor, Van Heflin. Now families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste, New Pepsodent with Irium. New, fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new, cool, minty flavor. Yes, in a recent test, new Pepsodent was preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. With families all over America, new Pepsodent is a favorite three to one. Families from coast to coast recently compared new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. They preferred new Pepsodent by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other brand they tried. These families, three to one, said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Yes, in a recent survey, families three to one said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. Get new Pepsodent toothpaste for your family right away. Now, the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. if he ever ran for president. He was tall and thin with straight, compressed white lips. He wore a neat pinstripe flannel suit with a small rosebud in the lapel. He carried an ebony cane. And he wore spats. He looked a smart 60, and unless his ulcers got nasty, I gave him another 15 years, which was pretty big of me. He sat down, speared me with those barbed gray eyes and came right down to business. Mr. Philip Marlowe, I believe? That's right. My name is Wadsworth Jeter. How do you do, Mr. Jeter? You're a private detective? Well, why not? Frankly, sir, I'd expected the Hollywood detective's office to be somewhat more glamorous or rather more 
elegant, shall we say? No. Philo Vance has a branch office here on the fourth floor if you're shopping oh, around. No, 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 no. You'll do, I'm sure. Well, my rate is 25 bucks a day, plus expenses. Money is no object. Except when you don't have much of it. That seems to be the motivating philosophy where Miss Harriet Huntress is concerned. Who or whom is Miss Harriet Huntress? A rather standard, rather obvious gold digger who wishes to marry Grover. Hmm. You want to tell me who Grover is? Grover is my adopted stepson, my late wife's son. Go on. Next year, he will inherit a million dollars left him by his mother. Which explains Miss Huntress's interest in Grover. Precisely. Look, Mr. Jader, am I being hired to smear Miss Harriet Huntress? Not at all. Merely to disillusion Grover about her. Yeah, well, that's the same thing. I think you'd better find yourself another no, boy. Wait, wait, there's more. Okay, let's hear it. Do you know a man named Marty Estelle? Sure, he's a big-time gambler out on Sunset Strip. Why? Mr. Estelle claims my son Grover owes him $50,000. Well, then Grover'd better pay up if I know Marty Estelle. But suppose my son doesn't really owe Estelle the money. Does he or doesn't he? Mr. Estelle supplied photostat copies of Grover's notes with Grover's signatures. I thought they might be forged, so without Grover's knowledge, I took them to a handwriting expert named John Arbogast. A sort of detective. No. He's not sure. He wants more time. I... I'd like you to take over the case. Harriet Huntress and all. Miss Huntress, as you may know, is associated with Mr. Estelle. Well, that's incidental. I'll handle the forgery case and not the slander job. Now, where does this Arbogast have his office? On Sunset Mirava. Okay, I'll look it up. Miss Huntress? She lives at the El Milano on North Sycamore. Right, I'll look her up, too. Arbogast and Huntress in the order named. <laughs> There was no snooty secretary to prevent me from walking right into John D. Arbogast's extremely fat presence on Sunset near Ivar. He was an enormously fleshy gent with a thick neck that was in folds like a concertina. He wore a wrinkled dark suit that needed cleaning and some reweaving where it had some small holes in it. Arbogast just sat and stared at me with the whites of his eyes. Because those three holes that needed reweaving were bullet holes. And John D. Arbogast was dead. Very recently dead. I left in a hurry, and as far as I could tell, nobody saw me come, nobody saw me go. My next stop was the Swank El Milano Hotel on North Sycamore. Just a second, mister. Something you want? Yeah, yeah. Who are you? I'm the house detective. Well, I'm looking for a Miss Harriet Huntress. Miss Huntress ain't seeing anyone. You can tell her it's Marty Estelle. Are you Marty Estelle? I'm from him. That's different, ain't it? That's none of your business, is it? Well, whatever you're up to, you're not playing it very smooth. Well, some days I feel like playing it smooth, and some days I feel like playing it like a waffle iron. Well, if you must know, I'm one of the boys. Philip Marlowe, private eye. Here. My card. Yeah, well, that's another story. I'll phone up to Miss Hunter. Yeah, uh, say I'm from Marty Estelle, and that make it convincing, huh? Uh, how much convincing? Oh, well, how much do those cigars you're smoking cost you? Twenty-two fifty, box of fifty. That much convincing. Well, that's cute. You and me are going to get along. I'll phone Miss Hunter, but you go right on up, room eight one four. I just know it'll be all right. <laughs> Huntress was too tall to be cute, too beautiful to be really cheap. Her green eyes were wide set and there was plenty of thinking room between them. Her hair was a dusky red, like fire seen through a haze. The green eyes were that much green ice as she sized me up in the doorway. Well, what's the big message, Sonny? I'd have to come in. I never could speak very well in public. Come in. Never could speak very well on a dry throat, either. There's the scotch. Help yourself. Thank you. So, you're from Marty Estelle? No, not, uh, strictly, not even loosely. <laughs> not at all, in fact. What's your racket? No racket. Marty will love to know you used his name. I'm shaking in my shoes. You're some kind of detective, aren't you? Yeah, right. Philip Marlowe. It's good scotch, Jim. I'm glad you like it. Now, what's your business? All right. How much will you take to give up Grover? You look smart, but 
You talk stupid. Old man Jeter's pretty tough. His idea is that you get nothing. You get smeared. I don't see it that way. How much? How about $50,000? How about $500? How about talking about the effect of the rain on the rhubarb? Now, look, sister. Suppose we skip the footwork, considering the sobering fact that a man named John D. Arbogast has already been murdered in this little case. Does that have anything to do with me? I don't know. He was hired to analyze some notes Grover gave Marty Estelle. He was killed just after I took over the case. Do you think Marty Estelle works that way? You know him better than I do, does he? Have you told the police yet? No, I thought I'd see if I could make a deal with you first. I'm going to tell you something. My people were nice people who never got involved in murders. Old Jeter ruined my father. My dad shot himself and my mother died of the shock. I'm going to fix Jeter for that someday. Even if I have to marry his son to do it. Adopted stepson really has no relation at all. It'll hurt Jeter just as hard. And... The kid will have a million dollars next year. I could do worse. Even if he does drink too much. You wouldn't want Grover to hear that now, would you? No. Turn around and have a look, gumshoe. I turned fast. He stood about four feet from me. Big, blonde, powerful. Whiskey in his brain and blood in his eyes. <laughs> I can say anything I want around Grover. It's all right with him. Isn't it, Grover? That's right, Harry. He's trying to break us up, Grover. What do you think of that? I think maybe I better break him up. That's what I think of that. <laughs> she laughed, and that made me mad. I turned a glow at her. It was a dirty look. It was the look of the month. That was a mistake. The big guy hit me. I went over sideways. It wasn't a hard punch, but my head to hit a desk going down, and the desk got the decision. It gets dark fast in Southern California, but seldom that fast. When I came out of it, Grover, the blonde sucker puncher, and Harriet Huntress were gone. But the bottle of scotch was still there, so I took that for a souvenir and stuffed it in my pocket and floated down the elevator into the street. It was dark by the time I got back to my apartment on Hobart Avenue in Hollywood. I turned on the light, and there stood a big guy, another big guy. This was National Big Guy Week. This one had a big nose, the dead color of wax. And he had a twenty-two caliber Colt Woodsman pointed straight at me. Close the door and reach. Come on. I turned a little to close the door. I got my hand under my coat. Then I turned back to wax nose fast. I had my luger out. We stood there facing each other. Waxnose didn't seem at all impressed with my automatic. I, uh, just came to tell you to be smart. You're looking at a Luger, mister. Yeah, I know. Men of distinction carry Lugers. Me, I pack this small bore because I can shoot. If uh, you think you can take me, go to it. Now, look, what's the game? Uh, maybe you can take a hint and maybe you can. Maybe, maybe not. What is it? Lay off, old cheaters, boy. When I wouldn't think of contradicting anyone who uses a Colt Woodsman twenty two with the front sight filed off must think he's pretty good. I am good. Yeah. And that's why I say, okay, pal. We'll see. Speaking of twenty twos, do you know anybody named John Arbogast? Uh, I meet such a lot of people. Well, this one was fat and shot three times with a twenty two. I don't remember shooting no fat guys today. So long, chum. Remember what I told you. Lay off, Grover. So long, John. Yeah. Swell. Ah, oh, shut up. Yeah. Mr. Mono? Oh, Mr. Jeter. Well, your son or your adopted son or your stepson or whatever he is poked me in the jaw today. He is both my stepson and my adopted son. Well, both of them poked me in the jaw. My word, where? In Miss Huntress's apartment. You spoke to her? What did she say? She wants 50 grand and no dice. I offered her 500. Just as a gag. Just as a gag? Mr. Marlowe, perhaps you underestimate the importance of this letter Listen, to me. Listen, Mr. Jeter, there are some very unusual angles to this case. For example, a gunman just stuck me up in my own apartment and told me to stay off of this case. What? I don't see why this case should get so tough. Good heavens. Listen, Mr. Marlowe, my chauffeur, Waldo, will pick you up in my limousine. I want to talk to you. All right. 
Well, tell Walter to park on Hobart facing Franklin. He'll be around for you in 20 minutes. Good. You just give me time to drink my dinner. Bye-bye. <laughs> Cavello Drive, we swung left for a couple of hundred yards, then left again, aiming for a driveway flanked by 12-foot wrought iron gates. Then something happened. Someone was standing in the glare of our headlights. Waldo swore and slammed on the brake shelf. You stupid girl, get out of the driveway! The man stepped toward us. And the next minute, there was that same Colt 22 staring to my face again. All right, this is a heist. Get out of the car, both of you. Look, Waxnose, haven't you had enough fun for one night? Fuzz off, bum. Shut up and get out. I'd have to think some more on that, Buster. I'm warning you, I'll let you have it. Don't be a ghoul, you ghoul. All right, you ask for it. Hey! <laughs> Hold it. You shot the guy. Yeah. I shot him. It was this. All in fun. Uh, yeah, some fun. It did the work. Uh, Jeter's house is right ahead. You sound as if you just shot a nickel and a pinball machine instead of a man. Now listen, turn off those lights and let's get out of here, but fast. You are listening to The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin. Yes, families all over America have named their favorite toothpaste. New Pepsodent with invigorating irium foam. New fresh-tasting Pepsodent with a new cool minty flavor. In a recent test, new Pepsodent was preferred three to one over any other toothpaste. It's true. Families all over America say new Pepsodent is their favorite three to one. The William Kilpatrick family, 212 South Missouri, Claremore, Oklahoma, preferred new Pepsodent on every single count. The Kilpatrick say, new Pepsodent tastes best of all, makes breath cleaner, makes teeth brighter. On all these counts, by an overwhelming average of three to one, families prefer new Pepsodent over any other toothpaste they tried. It's a fact. Families three to one say new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, this is not just our opinion. It's the honest conviction of the Kilpatricks and other families who are asked to compare new Pepsodent with the toothpaste they were using at home. Get new Pepsodent, the only toothpaste containing irium. Get it for your family without delay. We continue with the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin, who appears by arrangement with Metro Golden Mare, producers of The Romance of Rosie Ridge, starring Van Johnson. I drove back to my apartment again, leaving Waxnose lying dead in the Jeter driveway. We went back to my place to start all over again, over what was left of my purloined scotch. Yeah, this is good scotch you've got here, Marlowe. Pinch bottle. Not this, sure. I pinched it from the apartment of Harriet Huntress. <laughs> well, bottoms up. Waldo, do you think that gunman was there to scare young Grover into realizing Marty still means business? Could be. I always drove Grover home around that time. Uh, it just doesn't sound like Marty is still to pick that sort of a helper. Well, sure. Maybe that's why he picked him. Because it didn't seem like Marty is still. Yeah. Uh, that's good thinking, Waldo. Dartmouth, 37. Ra, ra, ra. That would be either the cops or Mr. Jeter. Hello. Mr. Mono? Yes, Mr. Dieter, and the reason we're not in your study now is lying outside of your front gate. What's that you're saying? Somebody jumped us outside of your gate and Wallace shot him dead. Good Lord. Yeah. Listen, Marlo, come here at once. Do you hear at once? I'll send Waldo, Mr. Jeter. I want to see you. You. Waldo will tell you all about it, Mr. Jeter. Marlo. Good night, Mr. Jeter. <laughs> After Walter, the chauffeur, had left, I went back to the El Milano Hotel. Hawkins, the house stick, was all smiles and open palms. I placed no confidence in his smile and a $20 bill in his palm. 
<laughs> Harriet Huntress again? Uh, what's the matter? Just take me up to her apartment, that's all, huh? Yeah, sure. Right this way, fella. Hawkins took me to the eighth floor, room 814, and opened the door. There was someone in the room, waiting. Uh, here's company for you, Mr. Estelle. Beat it, Hawkins. Yeah, this is the guy I was telling you about, Mr. Estelle. Come in earlier today. Said he was from you. Did I said. Oh, sure, sure. Come on in, Marlowe. I came to see Miss uh, Hunters, not you, Estelle. Well, first of all, Harriet's not home. I came to tell her what happened outside of Jeter's Gate. Mm. So you keep informed. I can't wait for her any longer. Got to get back to the casino. Well, then, what did you come back for, Marlo? I'm looking for the Jeter boy. After what happened to him tonight, he needs somebody to walk behind him. You think I play games like that? All I know is we were shot at. I asked you a question. I answered it to the best of my knowledge. What knowledge, for example? Well, for example, you hold $50,000 worth of Grover's notes for gambling debts. I've got $50,000 invested in the kid. Would I be likely to bump him off? Ah. That makes sense, all right. I always make sense. Oh, bully for you. When I have fifty grand invested in the guy, I'm apt to find out all about him. Like about old Jeter hiring a man named Arbogast to work for him. Ah? Uh -huh. Arbogast was shot today. You know it. I know because I had you followed. You didn't tell the law, Marlowe. That could be very hard on you. Well, it could. Does that make you and me friends? Hmm. A little blackmail, huh? Not much. We'll call it uh, tattletale grail mail. <laughs> <laughs> From now on, do you stop bothering Miss Huntress? Yeah, you win, Marty. Well, that's all. I've got to go. Well, I'll just uh, wait around for that, okay? Well, Harriet Scotch is in that cabinet there. Thanks. I'll roll up my pants and go waiting in it. <laughs> you know, Marla, I like you. You're cute. <laughs> so long, Chavez. <laughs> Marty Estelle was right. He wouldn't kill anybody who owed him money and was soon to come into a lot of it. Now I was in bed with the police for not reporting Arbogast's murder. Well, I looked around Harriet's apartment, vaguely, walked into the bedroom. He stopped. Because mixed with the fragrance of good perfume and good cosmetics was the plain, ordinary, homespun odor of gunpowder. I walked across the room and yanked open the closet door and stepped back. There, just as big as life, but as dead as they ever come, was young Grover Jeter. And at Grover's feet, among the graceful shoes in Harriet's closet, was a tiny pearl-handled automatic. I felt bad about that. Because I guessed that the dainty holes, the bullets from that dainty gun, would fit the two dainty holes over Grover's heart. I put the neat little pistol in my pocket. I, um, uh, I thought old man Jeter ought to know about his son. I thought. I didn't expect to find Waldo, the chauffeur, and Harriet Huntress with old Jeter in Jeter's big study, but there they were. Why, Mr. Marlow. I'd about given up hoping to see you tonight. Well, I changed my mind about coming out again, Mr. Jeter. Hello, Waldo. Hi, Marlo. Didn't expect to see you here, Miss Huntress. Didn't you? Did you expect to see me here? Never mind that, Marlo. I want to know where my son is. What do you mean, Mr. Jeter? He's missing. That's what I mean. Oh. Hmm. He's missing and no one knows where he is. I know. Eh? What's that? Where, Marlo? Miss Huntress, where did you and Grover go after Grover took that sucker punch at me in your apartment? We went out together in a taxi. During the ride, I had a change of heart. I didn't want Grover or Grover's money. I told Grover to find another playmate, and I got out in Beverly Hills. Grover went on in the taxi. Well, where did you go? Back to my apartment. Later, I got out my car to come down here and tell Mr. Jeter I decided to forget the whole thing. And for him to call off his dime novel salute. Well, a dime will no longer buy a novel of any description, but that is... Beside the point. You said you knew where Grover is. That's not beside the point, is it, Mr. Mallow? He's back in Harriet's apartment. Well, I didn't let him in. How on earth could Hawkins, he? Hawkins, your house detective let him in. The last I saw of Grover, he's dead. Oh, what? What's that? Dead. Dead. Shot with a small caliber gun. I can't believe it. I, I can't. It's... Grover's it's... dead? Miss Huntress, this twenty-five caliber pistol was on the floor at Grover's feet. Here, take it. Look it over, will you? 
line. You murderess. You... I'm not. You, you cold-blooded murderess. Oh, stop that. Stop it, both of you. It could have been suicide. Suicide? Well, yes. That's a possibility, of course. I see you like that idea, Jeter. But it wasn't suicide. Then she did it. The murderess. The scheming contempt. It was murder, and it's fairly obvious who did it, Jeter. Eh? Uh, Marty Estelle is my guess. Well, guess again, Waldo. Estelle had $50,000 invested in Grover. He wouldn't kill a golden goose like that. And Waxnose didn't do it because he was dead, thanks to Waldo here. That leaves her. She did it. There had to be a motive and an opportunity. Well, it was her apartment after all. Correct, Waldo. But Grover was Jeter's adopted stepson. Oh, like a real son he was to me. A real yeah, son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But did you lovely people know that in the state of California, a man can inherit from an adopted son who has money and who gets dead? Did you know that, Mr. Jeter? Why, what do you mean? Your inheriting Grover's million dollars would be a motive for killing him, wouldn't it? Mr. Marlowe. That was the motive, Jeter, and it was Waldo's job to find the opportunity to murder Grover for you. All right, Marlowe. That'll be all for you. Well, Waldo, the Dartmouth gun fanner. Huh? Drop that gun, Waldo. Shut up. I said drop it. Oh, no, drop uh, it. Hey, that's uh, nice shooting, Harriet. My hand, my hand. Well, Pop will put a little band-aid on for you, Waldo. Waldo, you could have gotten into my apartment wearing that chauffeur's uniform. Uh, you could have gone into the garage entrance and up the back way. Sure. When Grover let him in, he backed Grover into the room with his gun, but he shot him with yours. How much was Jeter going to pay you for this job, Waldo? Don't talk, Waldo. He's bluffing. You're telling me he's bluffing. Nice kids, these college boys. Tell me, was it Dartmouth or Danamora, Waldo? Shut up, copper. You killed John Arbogast to throw suspicion on Marty Estelle. Then you hired Waxnose to fake a holdup on Grover. Why? Again, to throw suspicion on Marty Estelle. To make it look as though Estelle was trying to stay, scare Grover into paying his gambling debts. If I hired Waxnose, why would I have shot him tonight? Because you like to kill people, Waldo. When I was brought out here tonight, Waxnose thought I was Grover in the car. He began to fake his holdup. But you just couldn't resist taking one of your snappy snapshots at Waxnose, could you, Waldo? Shut up, could you? Next. Mr. Wadsworth Jeter. Look here, Mallow. You you can't accuse me of... of... Doctor, he's sick. Call a doctor. Call a... It's his heart. If Jeter dies, it's your fault, Marlow. Okay, Waldo. Tell you what I'll do, Waldo. If Jeter dies, he doesn't have to pay me my fee. We're even. Okay, Waldo? Harriet Angel, listen, go call a doctor. And uh, while you're there, call the law, huh? <laughs> heart was as good as mine, if you want to make anything out of that. The law had Jeter and Waldo cold, and I mean cold. Me? Well, I went out a couple of times with Harriet, as I sat home with her a couple of times drinking her scotch. It was nice, all right, but I didn't have the money or the clothes or the manners. Still, I was sorry when she went to New York to live. She had absolutely the best scotch I ever tasted. Maybe because it was free. I don't know. You have just heard Van Heflin starring in the mystery series Raymond Chandler's The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, brought to you by the Lever Brothers Company, makers of Pepsodent. Van Heflin will return in just a moment. Have you tried, have you tasted the new Pepsodent toothpaste? Its lingering minty flavor is so fresh and inviting, families prefer it by an overwhelming average of three to one over any other toothpaste they tried. In a recent nationwide test, these families said new Pepsodent tastes better, makes breath cleaner, and makes teeth brighter. Remember, new Pepsodent gives you more invigorating irium foam. It sweeps dulling film away. No wonder it's the three-to-one favorite with families all over America. Get new Pepsodent with Arium for your family right away. Now, here is our star, Van Heflin. The need for food in Europe tonight is desperate. Starvation faces a multitude of our fellow men. There's a way you can help. For $10, a package containing 21 and a half pounds of food will be sent for you to a friend or a relative or any member of an organization you designate in Europe. Or simply say to a little French girl or to a Belgian war widow, your order will be 
strictly respected, and you'll receive a signed receipt from the person who received your gift. Send $10 now. Send all you can. Send your $10 to CARE. C-A-R-E. CARE, New York. Help keep America the hope of the world. Adapted by Milton Geiger from the story Trouble Is My Business by Raymond Chandler, creator of Philip Marlowe, the screen's most famous private detective. The original music was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray. This is Wendell Niles inviting you to listen again next week at this same time to another exciting mystery on the adventures of Philip Marlowe, starring Van Heflin with a distinguished cast. It was hot, boiling hot that night. I wanted to grab a beer and turn in early. So what happens? I get my beer, but with it comes a gunshot, a beautiful woman in trouble, and murder. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime mystery, CBS presents his most famous character, brought to you now in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Barlow, we bring you tonight's unusual story, Red Wind. There was a rough desert wind blowing into Los Angeles that evening. It was one of those hot, dry Santa Anas that come down through the mountain passes and curl your hair and make your nerves jump and your skin itch. On nights like that, every booze party ends in a fight and meek little housewives feel the edge of a carving knife and study their husbands' necks. Anything can happen when the Santa Ana blows in from the desert. I closed up my office early. I got tired of reading Philip Marlowe, private investigator, backwards on the ground glass of my office door. So I locked up and decided a nice cold beer would taste good before I went up to my apartment. Fill her up again, Mr. Marlin? Marlow. Oh, uh, Marlin. Yeah, Marlin's a fish. <laughs> yeah, I know. Marlin's also the name of a lady on the radio. Marlin, comma, Mary, the story of. Yeah, my wife listens to it. Yeah, oh, good for her. Hey, right. you a bartender? Another ride. Yeah, that drunk again. What do you expect in this business? Autograph hounds? Make it sappy. You hear? Be right with you, sport. Gotta draw this man a beer. Crying out loud, these stumble bums. Hey, Bud. You got another customer, Bacchus. Uh, hey, Bud, you seen a lady in here lately? A lady? A tall, good-looking, brown hair, a print bolero jacket, and a blue silk dress. No, sir. No, sir. Uh, nobody like that, Spinning. All right, straight scotch fast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. As the man drank, I noticed the drunk was grinning at him. And then, without changing his grin, the drunk swept a gun from somewhere so fast it was just a blur coming out. Made a couple of hard snaps and a little smoke. Very little. <laughs> you other guys, don't move. So long, Waldo. Don't move, you two. Poor Waldo. I bet I made his nose bleed. So long, boys. Drink up. Get on the phone, kid. I'll get his license number. Holy smoke. Too late. He drove away in the dead guy's car. Uh, maybe he ain't dead. No, he's dead, all right. Oh. That guy was using a 22 target pistol. Yeah. When they use that kind of gun, they don't make mistakes. Yeah. Where's your phone? This uh, is for the police. Uh, Prowl car boys were there in five minutes. Waldo was out of business, all right. Nothing in his pockets told who he was, but he had about $700 on him. And with that kind of heavy coin, you can buy a good 1910 automobile even today. Well, I told the cops what I knew, including about Waldo's brown-haired pretty girl in the bolero jacket. It was about 9 o'clock when I stepped out of the elevator in my apartment house and almost walked right into a brown-haired pretty girl in the bolero jacket, waiting for the elevator on my floor. Just a minute, lady. What is it? I'm a great admirer of Bolero jackets. What? Now, take the one you've got on, for instance. I'm sorry, but I'm in a hurry. No, 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 wait. If you'll be good enough to let me... Oh, you've made me miss the elevator. That's just as well. What? Well, it's better you don't go out in those clothes. What do you mean? Tall, good-looking, Bolero jacket, blue silk dress. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Lady, might I take the trouble of telling you that you're in trouble? Trouble? Yeah, the cops are looking for you. In those clothes. I haven't done anything. Maybe not. But if I were you, I'd have a little talk with me. I've all the nerve... I'm in room 41 across the hall. I know things about you. Well... Good girl. Come along. It took a firm grip on her arm, but I managed to get her to my room. I rustled up some drinks, but when I turned to give her hers, I... I saw she held a small automatic. She looked at me steadily. I put down both glasses slowly so I wouldn't be misunderstood. Look, sister, I, I, I know it's hot tonight and heat does funny things to people, but uh, let's put that little thing away and have a nice cool drink, huh? Don't move. Oh, I'm strictly frozen in my tracks. Stay that way. Okay, okay. But wouldn't you like to know that I'm a private detective? Private detective? Yeah, I can prove it if you'll let me. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I don't like those things pointed at me. I'll have that drink. Oh, good. I don't often give good liquor away like this. I can't afford it. Why are they after me? Well, a man was just shot in a bar down the street. Before he got it, he'd been asking about a tall, pretty girl with a bolero jacket. What did he look like, this man? Oh, he was tall, about 5'11". Slim, dark, dark brown eyes with a lot of glitter. Dark suit, white handkerchief in the breast pocket. And he must have seen you early at night to know how you were dressed. Am I getting anywhere? He used to be my... My chauffeur. You had an appointment with him, didn't you? I... He asked for you, didn't he? Yes, I had an appointment with him. He'd stolen something from me when he left three days ago. I was going to buy it back from him. Why didn't you tell the police? I couldn't tell them. It was valuable, wasn't it? Valuable enough for Waldo to steal. Fifteen thousand dollars. Peanuts. But it wasn't the value. You see, it meant something to me. The man I loved gave it to me. And now he's dead. He shot down over Germany. Now go back and tell my husband that. He'll, he probably hired you. He did? How much is he paying me? And uh, where is this husband of yours? He's at a meeting. This late at night? He's a very important man. The hydroelectric engineer. Never mind about him. What about Waldo? Why was he knocked off? You mean he's dead? Waldo is dead? Yes, yeah, sister, he's dead. Very dead. Oh. Screaming won't bring him back. I'm not going to scream. Who would that be? There's a dressing room behind the door. Hide there. Take your glass, will you? All right, all right. I went to the door, making a loud, yawning sound. Foolishly, I didn't have my gun. That was a mistake. Because when I opened the door, the guy on the other side certainly had one. A 22 target automatic that had already killed one man that night. And I knew the bald head, the flat, shiny eyes, and the face like a poisonous lizard. Baldy put the muzzle of his gun lightly against my throat. I backed into the room and Baldy kicked the door shut. You alone? Look for yourself. I'm asking, not looking. I'm alone. You and that dumb bartender saw me dust off Waldo. What did Waldo do to you? Who's asking? Just making conversation. He stooled on me on a bank job we did together. Got me four years in Michigan Penn. How is he? Dead. <laughs> well, I'm still good. Drunk or sober. Tell me why I came here, pal. You heard the barkeep and me talking. I told him my name and where I lived. Hmm. That's how, pal. I said, why? Skip it. The hangman won't ask you to guess why he's there. You're pretty tough at that, ain't you, pal? But you're slamming off. All right. But, uh, could you get that gun out of my neck and try somewhere else? Just any place. This better? This suits you all right? Yeah, just so it isn't my neck. Say when, pal. It's your party. I leaned against the gun weakly. The door of the dressing room showed a crack of darkness. The crack widened. I began to shake a little in spite of the heat. The girl came quietly into the room, but there was white all around her irises. She was scared. She had a gun in her hand, but I was sorry for her. Dead sorry. She tried to make the door a scream. Either way, it would be curtains for both of us. Scared, mister? Worried about any little thing? I couldn't talk. 
The girl floated in the air somewhere behind Paul Lee. Their horrified face was drifting toward us. My mouth was as cold and dry as yesterday's toast. Well, kid, how's it feel? You ready yet? Say the word. Well, don't take all night about it. If you're going to do something about it, do it. Why not, pal? I like this. Suppose I yell. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Put up Go your ahead. Hand. Hey, look! <laughs> oh. Thanks, sister. That buys me. Everything I have is yours, now and forever. <laughs> They're dead? And flatter me, no end, lady. I only punched him. Now get out of here while I call the yes. cops down on this killer. Yes. Good night. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That jacket marks you for the cops. Leave it here. You don't need it in this kind of weather. Yes, here. Okay. See you again. Why? I don't know. Who might it be the rival of a dead flyer and things like that? Now, on second thought, forget the whole thing. I'll see that the police get Jesse James here. Good night, lady. Yeah? You mean me? Yes, please. Oh, you again. Get in. I want to talk to you. You want to know what happened at headquarters? Yes. I went down to headquarters with the law and gave him the story. I left you out of it. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you saved my life. So no one knows anything about you. Incidentally, neither do I. My name is Mrs. Frank Barsley. 212 Fremont Place. Olympia 24596. Is that what you wanted? I guess so. Well, there it is. Now, why'd you really come back? I wanted my pearls. Oh, no. Pearls, too? Yes. All right, tell me about the pearls. <laughs> We've had a murder, a beautiful mystery woman, and a sadistic killer, and an heroic rescue. Now we will have pearls. I was to buy them back from the man called Waldo. Well, I saw everything that came out of his pockets. There weren't any pearls. Could they be hidden in his apartment? It's possible. Waldo lived on the same floor you do. In this apartment house. And why didn't I know him, at least by sight? Well, he just moved in last week. He managed to get a sublet. Sort of amateur magician on the side, huh? It's, uh, getting rather late. Yeah. What about your husband this hot, mysterious night? He's still at his meeting. Good. Why did you say that? I didn't have any answers. We just sat there looking at one another. I was suddenly aware of the hot desert wind stirring up the night. I took hold of her and I kissed her. She sat very still. I was shaking when I let go of her. Her voice trembled a little when she spoke. I meant you to do that. Oh, I wasn't always this way. Only since Johnny Dolmes was killed in the war. He gave me those pearls. Forty-one of them. With a diamond propeller clasp. <laughs> I'd have loved them if they were wooden beasts because he gave them to me. I loved Johnny. The way you love just one time. You understand that? Yes, I can. What I don't understand is how you could explain a $15,000 pearl necklace to your husband. I told him they were imitation. That I bought them myself. How did Waldo latch onto them and what they stood for? When my husband was in Argentina, Waldo and I would go for long drives. I was restless and wretched because of Johnny. Sometimes Waldo and I had a little drink together. But that was all. But you confided in Waldo about those pearls. Yes. And when your husband came back, Waldo stole the pearls and offered to sell them back to you. He'd tell Papa. Oh, I was a fool. And now you think the pearls are upstairs in Waldo's apartment. I suppose it's a lot to ask. I've been paid. Now go look. Wait here. Was 
I gone long, no. Lola? Well? No. No pearls? No pearls. Oh. There was a man in Waldo's room. Man? Who? You know a guy named Leon Velasanos? No, not by name. I don't know. Mexican, South American, about 45, small, iron gray hair, very neat. Fawn colored suit, wine colored tie. No. I don't think I know such a man. You say he was in the room? Yeah. Well, what did he say? Very little. In fact, nothing. He was dead. You are listening to the adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by one of America's most outstanding writers of crime and mystery fiction, Raymond Chandler. Our story for today, The Red Wind, continues in just a moment. But first, a message of interest for all young men. How would you like to be up there in the wild blue sky, flying America's mightiest bombers, fastest fighters, and newest jet jobs? Believe me, it's a great feeling to know that you have the skill, the courage it takes to become a pilot officer in the United States Air Force, the Air Force that's second to none. Keep your eye on the local newspapers and your nearest Army Air Force recruiting station. An aviation cadet recruiting team will be in your community soon. If you're between the ages of 20 and 26 and a half years of age, single and a high school graduate, plan to see the aviation cadet interviewing team. If you pass the mental and physical examination, you'll be accepted for the 52-week aviation cadet training program. When you graduate, you'll be a second lieutenant in the U.S. Air Force, the mightiest of all. And now, back to the adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Bohr as our star, we continue today's adventure. I sat with Lola Bosley in her car, listening to the hot wind gallop around in the midnight streets. I just told her about the Latin-looking man I'd found in Waldo's room in a very dead condition. I held her hand until they stopped trembling, and then I gave her the few remaining details. He had a gun in a shoulder holster, but someone had strangled him before he could set up in business with a gun. Someone? You mean Waldo? Maybe. You see that convertible coupe two cars ahead of us? Oh, it's been there for hours there before I parked here to wait for you. Well, Leon, the guy in Waldo's room, came in that car. But according to the key container he carried, it isn't his car. And whose car is it? Does it matter? Yeah, it belongs to a lady, according to the tag on the car key. Eugenie Kolchenko, West Los Angeles. I've never heard of her. Mm-hmm. Well, you better go home now. What are you going to do? I'll drive that flossy convertible around and wave at my friend. Impress people. You run along now. Me, I've got another date. Yes, what is it, please? Miss Eugenie Kolchenko? Yes, what is it? Did you lose or misplace a pigeon gray convertible coupe? What are you saying? Don't be alarmed, I found it, brought it home to you. Come in, please. Uh, it is a reward, you wish. Shall we Snap say... Snap out of a dragon, lady. Who was he? Who was who? A little guy, Leon. You loaned your car to. He's dead. Who was he? Oh, no. No. Eugenie. Darling, darling, come here, please. What's the matter, my dear? Who is this man? I came about Miss Kolchenko's car. What about her car? Well, the gentleman who borrowed it couldn't return it on account of he isn't alive. He's dead, darling. He is dead. That's putting it more bluntly, of course. Dead, huh? Yeah, completely. Who are you? Philip Marlowe, private investigator. My card. Hmm. Have you told the police yet? Never do at once what can be profitably deferred pending negotiation. Aesop. I might negotiate. Peachy. Just what do you know, Marlowe? Well, a man named Waldo was shot in a bar tonight. I happen to have the insight as to who he was, and when I visited his apartment tonight, I found this Leon Velasanos dead. He wouldn't have had $500 and 20s on him, would he? No. But this Waldo had over $700 on him when he was killed in that cocktail bar, mostly in 20s. Mm. Is there a basis for negotiation yet? Very well, Marlo. There were certain bills for some stuff Miss Kolchenko here had charged to my account. But, darling, you told me I might charge to your account. All right, my dear, so I wasn't bright. That might be the understatement of the decade, but go on. I had the bills safely in my briefcase. 
Somehow, this Waldo had a chance to steal the briefcase. I hired Leon, gave him $500 to buy back those bills from Waldo. Instead, Waldo took Leon's coupons, was forced to kill Leon in the process. Then he went out to keep another date and walked into an old pal hostile enough to blow him down. Huh? And somebody still has those bills, and I'm in for a divorce suit, huh? Hmm. The man who shot Waldo got away in Waldo's car with your briefcase in it, could be. Cops caught him. And the police have the briefcase? Maybe. But the police are interested in solving crimes, not in tossing mud for the benefit of sensation eaters. I have a friend or two at headquarters. Let me see what I can do. It's worth $500 to me, Marlowe. Then that's what it'll cost you. Good luck and thank you, Mr... Marlowe. Philip Marlowe, remember? Marlowe. My name is Frank Barsley. Barsley? Oh. And just what does that mean? The big hydroelectric engineer. Yeah. Yes, how'd you know? Never mind. May I use your telephone? Someday I must tell you about Ibarra. Now he's a soul of the earth, Ibarra. Detective lieutenant over at Central Homicide. Well, I phoned Ibarra from Miss Kolchenko's house and told him where he could find a well-dressed cadaver named Leon and furnished a few small details. I gave Ibarra time to check my tip, and then I went down to see the good lieutenant and told him why I'd been up in Waldo's room, only to find Leon instead of a certain lady's string of pearls. Pearls, eh? Yeah, I thought Waldo might have had them up there. Whose pearls were they? The ladies. Go on. Oh, they might have been in Waldo's car that Waldo's killer drove away in. Yeah. What? Yeah. They might have. Yeah. Also, a batch of bills charged to the account of a certain Frank Bosley. Yeah. The police aren't interested in domestic scandal. They want to prevent or solve crimes, right? So? So, I've got $500 for the police fund. Mm. If those pearls and those bills are returned to their rightful owners. Quit your kidding. It's a valuable necklace. Yeah. There's your necklace. Take it away. On the level, Ibarra? Just tell me straight what it's all about. All I ask. Sure, sure. Well, you see, this Waldo was blackmailing a wife with the pearls and her husband with the bills. Mm -hmm. Bosley, that's the guy's name, sent Leon to get the bills from Waldo. Waldo killed him and then stepped out and got nailed by that guy in the bar he'd stool pigeoned against once. Mm -hmm. Well, if Bosley's name stays out of the papers, I get 500 bucks. It goes to the police fund. Thanks. We'll keep him out. I'm not in this case for money. I just want to get back the bills and the pearls. Sure. And like you say, Marlo, the police aren't in business to sling mud. Look, you can deliver the pearls to the lady yourself if you like. No, you better take them to her, Marlo. You see, except for that diamond propeller clasp on them, they're phony. Phony? But look, Marlo, I know pearls. Real pearls feel gritty between the teeth. These are hard and glassy. Try. Yeah. Yeah. They're phony. All but the clasp, Marlo. All but the clasp. I took the pearls and had them appraised the next morning at a gilt-edged place in Beverly Hills. Phony all but the clasp. An imitation as good as these couldn't have been made that fast. These were the pearls that Waldo had stolen. I took the glass pearls to a dive on Melrose and had them duplicated for $20. I had the jeweler attach the diamond clasp to the $20 duplicate string of pearls. Then I called up Lola. Hello, Lola. Okay, you're in? Oh, Mr. Marlowe. Yes, it's okay here. I have a string of pearls for you. Oh, really, Philip? Really, did you get... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Lola. Waldo was getting set to jip you. We sold the real pearls and made up a string with the diamond clasp. Oh. Well, may I at least have the clasp? Sure. Meet me at four at Nikolaev's. Nikolaev's at four. I'll be there. These are the pearls the police found in Waldo's car. You're right. They're not my pearls. I'm sorry, Lola. No. Still have the clasp Johnny gave me. Well, I'm happy if you are. Happy? No, not quite happy. See, this morning my husband told me where to separate. Oh, I'm very sorry, Lola. 
You've been very kind. That's all right. Listen. Goodbye, I suppose. Yeah. You'll never get over Johnny Dalmas. Goodbye, Lola. And if anybody ever bothers you again, let me know, huh? Name's Marlowe. Philip Marlowe. I'll remember. Philip Marlowe. I drove almost to Malibu. And then I parked. And then I walked, way out on a rock cliff, jutting into the Pacific Ocean. And then I reached into my pocket and dug out the string of bohemian glass pearls that Lieutenant Ibarra had found in Waldo's car. I cut the knot at one end and slipped the pearls off, one by one. One by one, I flipped them into the water. Should have seen the gulls swoop down on them. Then they flapped up again, screaming indignantly. Phony pearls. They'd fooled Waldo and Lola Barsley. But they couldn't fool the seagull. I said aloud, To the memory of Johnny Delmas, just another four-flusher. I listened a while to the wheeling seagulls. All at once, I realized that the wind had died. The Santa Ana had blown itself out. The red wind was done. It was over. It was cool again. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, created by Raymond Chandler, stars Gerald Moore and is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. In tonight's story, Red Wind, Lola was played by Peggy Weber and Barry Kroger was Baldy. Joan Banks played Eugenie Kolchenko. Jeff Corey was Lieutenant Ibarra. Carly Bear was Barsley. Lou Krugman was Waldo, and Wilms Herbert played the bartender. The special music was conceived and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time an old Spanish woman who cared, a red-headed mink who didn't, and a green suede button beside a corpse. All led me to a wounded man with a gun in his hand, cornered on a warehouse roof. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Man on the Roof. Talk to him. Mooney! On the roof, he's over the edge there. Fire, Mooney! Matthews, hold it. Mooney, don't shoot again. What are you talking about, Marlowe? He's a killer. He's armed and dangerous. Listen to me. What do you want us to do? Scald him and send him home without a supper? Matthews, I'm going up after him. No, no you're not, Marlowe. Come here. Let go of me, Matthews. Listen, Marlo, nobody goes up there. We're going to gas him out. Come on, Mooney. Call for launchers. Matthews, please, listen to me, will you? No, why not? Tell me the whole story. We've got nothing but time till I get here with those launchers. Please, Matthews, quick kid. Nobody is kidding, Marlowe. That boy up there is a killer. Keep watching that roof, Becker. 
You make it curious. Well, Marlo, this story you got. About ten minutes ago, Matt. That's the beginning, Marlo. Go on, Phil. I'm trying to. Start at the front. I'm a sucker for the tail. You're going to have all before the tear gas arrives. Okay, Matthews, I'll start at the front and skip nothing. Right. I'll start where it started four hours ago at five o'clock this evening, some 15 miles from here on the outskirts of a little town of San Fernando. A telephone call from a woman whose voice had said that she was old in Spanish and very worried had brought me out to the place. A woman named Senora Andrade who told me that her only boy was heading for a lot of trouble and that I had to stop him. The Andrade home stood out like a thoroughbred alongside the milkman's horse in comparison to the other houses squatting on the sun-baked soil. The senora herself, at maybe 60 and in a cheap black cotton dress, a lace shawl and homemade slippers, was the tidiest person I'd ever seen. When she bowed from the waist in graceful greeting, I saw a single small ivory comb was the only thing holding a mass of long gray hair in one neat bundle. Senor Marlo, you will excuse me if I do not extend you the hospitality of my house, but Pedro, uh, Pete, likes to be named. It's already gone. There is no wasting time. Of course. Uh, Peach your son, senora, huh? Si. And a good boy, senor Marlo. Here. Here is a photograph of him. It is taken only a week ago on his 25th birthday. Really? He was so proud of that green jacket I made for him. It was suede and flashing, he said. Flashing like something the rich Mr. Alex Brucher would wear. He has it on every day since then, even today. Alex Brucher, who's that, Mrs. Andrade? The senor who owns the warehouse for furs in Los Angeles. Oh? Number 12, Commercial Street. It's where my people worked until two days ago, when the trouble started. Well, what happened, senora? It was during his lunch time. He was eating from a meal I made for him like he always does, and talking to a stranger, some... Um, how you say, senor? A man with no job all the time. A, a bum, a hobo, a loafer? Uh, si, a loafer, <laughs> si. He was just telling me... How, how he was telling him to find the railroad yards. That, senor, is where the trouble began. Oh, please, senor Marlo, you will have a chair there. Oh, yes, thanks. Now, uh, tell me, senora, this trouble. Surely giving instructions to a loafer, as you say, didn't start it. Oh, but it did. After the lunch hour, the foreman, a senor Connor, questioned Pedro about this loafer. And when my boy said that the man was only asking for the railroad yards, this... Senor Connor said he was a liar, that Pedro was giving out information about the shipments of furs, that he was fired, discharged. Just like that? Let's see, senor. After two years of good, hard work. You see, senor Marlo, Pedro tells me that senor Alex Brucher has been having his shipments of furs stolen on the road. Um, Hijack? Uh, let's see, mm -hmm. hijacked. And it is this reason why Pedro is fired. You, uh, you want me to prove to Mr. Alex Brucher that Pete had nothing to do with his hijacking, huh? Get his job back, is that no, it? No, 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 senor. It is too late. Why too late? Pedro already went down there this morning to do that. Oh. He went and told senor Connor, the foreman, that he had nothing to do with the hijack. And more, he told him, senor Marlo, that he was fired because of Helen Castile. Who's that? The pretty girl who for a short time now works in senor Brucher's office. Oh. Well, then I don't understand, senora. This Helen Castile and my boy are falling in love. But senor Brucher also likes this girl. Oh. What happened when Pete told this to Mr. Brucher? He never did. Before he even got to speak to senor Brucher, that devil man, senor Connor, and some other men beat him. Cut his face, blood on his arms, his clothing torn. He came home just before I called to you. Almost dead, senor. Oh. I'm sorry. Well, uh, how about now? No, senor Marlo. Pedro has gone back. Revenge in his heart. That is why you must stop him. Senor, senor, you must bring him home before he kills. Before it is too late. Take it easy. No, I'm a no, no, take it easy, senor. Don't worry. I'm sure I can bring him back. Positive. Oh, gracias, senor. It's all right. It's all right. Here, here senor, in this can. I have money. Nineteen, maybe more dollars here. You take no, it. No, 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 no. Not yet, Mrs. Andrade. I have... Uh, uh, I don't think it'll cost that much. We'll see, huh? Goodbye, senora. It was an hour's drive to the Brucher Fur Company warehouse on Commercial Street in downtown L.A., I started up a long cement ramp that led to a glass cage in a far corner of the warehouse marked office. 
It was just about the end of a working day. And when I was next to the door, let it enter, a bell someplace said that the end had arrived. You could tell the way everyone's spirits went up. Everyone except the girl inside, half leaning on a file cabinet. I figured she was Helen Castile until I got closer. The on fire red hair and green eyes with hat and shoes to match could have gotten by. But the coat she wore was mink. So was the attitude. That would never take shorthand for 40 bucks a week. Things just couldn't get that tough. Hello. You look like you lost something. Oh, is Helen still here? Helen Castile? Don't powder her nose. Maybe back before she leaves for the day. May not. I don't know. Oh. You a friend of hers? No, Pete Andrade's. Never heard of him. Got a life. Oh. Please. Sure, sure. Now, uh, tell me, Miss... Haynes. Corey Haynes. You? Marlow. Philip Marlow. Miss Haynes, is Alex Brucher around? Mm-mm. Home packing is going out of town. It does mm. every other week. Important business? No, I just wanted to chat with him a while. Oh, Connor, is uh, Alex's car Gaston ready for me? Yeah, it's ready. It's ready, Miss Haynes. Here are the keys. Thank you. And, Connor, please, stop wishing I were dead, will you? I can feel it, and it gives me the creeps. Oh, I'm so sorry, Miss Haynes, but... Well, maybe we won't be seeing so much of one another so soon. If you mean Helen Castile, Connor, she's a great secretary, period. Yeah, sure. Now you, Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe. I'm a friend of Pete Andrade's. I want to... said enough, mister. Almost too much. Now, wait a minute, Connor. Oh, what I... for? A lot of hot air? Listen, Marlowe, we've been running into all kinds of trouble around here. Hijacking, short shipments, misdirected cargoes, it works. So? So it all adds up to somebody on the inside helping somebody on the outside, and that ain't good. Take my advice, brother. Get your long nose out of this place and keep it out if you don't want it bent. It's the phone, Connor. If you lift it up, it'll stop that noise. Very funny. Hello. Oh, hello, Mr. Brucher. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I got it. Charming fella, isn't he? He'll be down here in a couple hours mm. and I'm to wait. Check. Check, Mr. Brucher. Goodbye. His master's voice. Mm. Very funny again. Uh, you'd better let me have the keys back, Miss Haynes. The boss isn't going out of town after all. He'll probably want his car. And I'll probably give it to him myself after I've run a few errands I have in mind. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. I hope we meet again in more pleasant surroundings. You two go to rival schools, Connor? Get out of here, Marlowe. Get out before you get the same treatment your friend Pete Andrade got. Oh, you've got to be kidding. You wouldn't do that to me, Connor. I'm not in love with Helen Castile. That goes for you, too, in spades. Hey, you, Mr. Marlow. What? Over here behind the crates. I don't want Connor to see us. I'm Helen Castile. How do you know who I am? There's an intercom phone in the office you just left. Yeah, I see what you mean. I knew Pete was in some trouble. I haven't heard from him in two days. <laughs> Mr. Marlow, what they've done to him is terrible. How do you know about it? Did Pete come to you? No, his mother hired me. I'm a private oh. detective, which uh, Helen brings up a sharp point. Are you sure you're not playing both sides, baby? Well, you all right, up... save it, save it. That's all I want to know. What do you want... You mean you just said that to see how I'd act? Well, I had to be sure. After all, you're still working for Alex Brucher. Not anymore. I only stayed on before this because I didn't want Pete to be fired. Oh, shh, the... shh, hold it. I think we've got company. It could be rats. There's some around. Yeah, with and without brass knucks. Now listen, honey, for everybody's good, I don't want Pete mixing with Alex Brucher. Now, before you get out of here, tell me fast, where does the boss live? 41 West Adams. 41 on. West. Okay, now go. I'll cover you until you clear of the place. Go on. All right, my car's across the street. If you need any help later, Mr. Marlowe... Get Marlo. going. That rat may have friends. Okay. Goodbye, Mr. Marlowe. Helen got to the front gate, out into her car, and away without anybody bothering her. And a couple of minutes later, I covered the same smooth course, and I was beginning to believe that the rats were just that, except that when I was in behind the wheel of my coupe and heading for Adams Boulevard... I picked up a pair of headlights in my rear-view mirror, which for the next 40 minutes have zigzagged, stuck like they were painted there. But finally, a traffic jam gave me all the break I needed. And a sharp right turn, followed by a lot of speed, left me free and once again on my way to West Adams Boulevard. The place was turn-of-the-century stone block mansion, but the rest of the neighborhood had gone slumming a long time ago. I was about to try the knocker when I noticed a thin slice of pale light that said the front door wasn't closed all the way. 
I started in, edging toward the sick light that came from a single lamp in what used to be called the library. And then suddenly I saw him. A man in a smoking jacket, lavishly monogrammed A.B., his face beaten raw, his clothing almost shredded, blood clotted thick on the back of his head. He was dead in the corner of the room. Next to the body was a heavy marble lamp base, also bloody. Inches from that, I found something that might as well have been Pete Andrade's calling card. A button made of green suede ahead of my pocket just before the company spoke up. Don't go for your gun, Marlowe. That'll leave us even. <laughs> so the kid finally made it, huh? Maybe. Maybe I did it, Connor. Nuts, you just came in, I know. I was waiting outside. And the jerk I had on your trail last year, I figured I'd better leave the office, but quick, I figured right. But tell me, Marlo, just so I score 100%. What's your angle? The Andrade kid's mother. I'm a private detective who was working for her. She was afraid of this. Oh, no. Stop. The sentiment's killing I me. wish something would. Well, let's call the police. Not so fast. What do you mean? I've already got the rest of my figuring done. But now the kid should be at his girlfriend Helen's flat. I know where it is, and that's where I'm going. You see, Marlo, I want to be a hero. I want to bring the kid in. Understand? Oh, sure, sure. Real easy. You want to bring him in dead. That way nobody even mentions the beating you gave him on Brooch's orders. Because he wouldn't stay away from Helen. That way you're clean. Exactly. Clean as a whistle. Except for you and your big mouth. Now stand still, Peeper. I want to whisper something in your ear. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, you're going to think the laughter of April Fool's Day came late when you listen to CBS this Wednesday night, for it's going to be one of the craziest, merriest, maddest nights of entertainment you've ever heard. Bing Crosby will be playing host to Arthur Godfrey and Perry Como. And even though lots of singing is promised from all three, who knows what's going to happen when the gags start flying. Groucho Marx and Burns and Allen will also be on hand with their famous fun shows this Wednesday. These great stars will be here on most of these same CBS stations. Burns and Allen, Groucho Marx, and Arthur Godfrey and Perry Como as Bing Crosby's guests. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Man on the Roof. started toward me with a 38 wrapped in his thick fist, I figured I'd better do something about him and do it fast. I waited until he walked around Bruce's body on the floor and it was out of his line of vision and I pointed at it. Connor, look, look, he's moving. What's that? Hey! Uh, oh. An old trick, sucker. Now let's throw your gun out of the conversation. It was thought over. Come on, get up. Get your hands up. Get him off, you crummy. Uh, uh. Look, Heavy, I'm going to get an answer out of you one way or another. Make it easy on yourself. Now get up. I said get up. Oh. All right. All right, boys. You win this round. That's better. What do you want to know? Helen Castile's address. She's got her room. No, number four. 3,200 Crenshaw. Hey, thanks. thanks. So long, muscles. I knew there wasn't much more I could do for a desperate hothead named Pete Andrade. He'd already done too much for himself in the wrong direction. I drove down Adams until I'd cooled off enough to call the police. And I stopped at a phone booth and gave Homicide a fast rundown on Alex Bruch's murder. But I hung up before they could ask me Senora Andrade's address in San Fernando or Helen Castile's place on Crenshaw. Because there were two women I wanted to talk to alone before the police moved in. After that, I drove out to Crenshaw and found the number 3200. Room four was at the far end of a half-lit hall. And there were voices inside. One was Helen's. The other was Pete Andrade. I reached for my gun. I went out of my head, Helen. I must have hit him nine or ten times. Hard. What was on the I don't know. I've got to think. It's a little late for thinking, oh, Pete. Who are you? He's a private detective. Yeah, I'm working for your mother. I was up until I left Bruch's place. He's dead, Pete. Oh, Pete. Oh, no. I didn't mean to kill him. But I'm not sorry. I want you to come along with me, Pete. Quietly. Turn yourself in. No. <coughs> Pete. Helen, get me. away from me. Stop it. Oh, you little... <laughs> He's gone! Yeah, got it! Don't move, Marlo. Don't move or I'll shoot. You crazy fools. I knew you wouldn't shoot me, Marlo. 
Next time you'll be surprised. There won't be a next time. We're going to get away. It's our only chance now. You haven't got a chance to be a run. You'll be dogged every minute of your short lives. You'll wind up full of bullets in the dark. You'll be running down a blind alley, and it starts right there with that door. Don't be suckers. Shut up. We're going to try it, Marlowe. And we'll make it. We've got to have money, Pete. Yeah, and I know where to get it, too. Brucher always kept plenty of petty cash in the office at the warehouse. I'll take that. What about the watchman, Pete? Are you going to keep on killing? Pete, listen. You can get in quietly with Brucher's keys. Corey Haynes has them. The office keys are in the same ring as the car keys. She always borrows them when she uses his car, and she's got it tonight. Well, I'll get them from her. Where does she live? Out on Orange Drive. 210, I think. Will you but... listen to me a minute? You're heading for the original dead end, both of you. Why don't you give yourselves a break? Now, what do you call a break, Marlo? Pete rotting in some prison until we're both too old to care? I'd rather have the bullet. Let's get him out of here. That closet will do. Go on, Marlo, inside. Move! Sure, sure. What are you waiting for? Go on, close it. I know what you tried to do for my mother, Marlo, and for Helen and me. I'm sorry it couldn't work out. Thanks, anyway. Nuts. I'm leaving, Helen. I'm ready. You're not coming. You're staying here. What? Marlo was right. This is a blind alley, a dead end, and I won't take you in. No, it. Pete, I'm going with you. No, you're not. Stay back. I mean it. Please. Stay back, I tell you. <laughs> Helen. Helen, unlock this door. We still may be able to stop him. I'm playing this my way now, Marlo. You can stay where you are. Helen, don't you understand? I'm I on your him. side. I'm going with him whether he wants me or not. So long, Marlo. Happy landings, baby. The lock on the closet door gave up before I did, but only because it was older by several years. I got out of the house and kept ahead of the speed limit all the way to Orange Drive and figured for what it was worth that I'd cut Pete's lead down to a scant ten minutes. I parked in front of a spudnut coffee shop on the corner and walked down to 210. By the time I got within knocking distance of Corey Haynes' front door... I could see that the only light in the place was spilling out of the sunken double garage that housed the new gray Nash. But when I moved closer, I knew that ten minutes was all that Pete Andrade had needed. Corey was sprawled out on the grease-spattered concrete floor and very still. Very still. And standing limply against the wall was Helen Castile, staring down at the redhead with a pair of hopeless eyes that seemed already half dead. As I walked down the ramp, she heard me and looked up. I knew you'd get here. I don't care now. We're both late, is that it? Yeah. I didn't see him. He was already gone when I got here. Found her like that. Then he must have gotten the keys. Yes, from her purse. I'd sit over there. Uh huh. Why didn't you follow him? You knew where he was heading. I couldn't. I, when I saw her there, I, I just couldn't because I think she's dead too. No, no. She isn't dead. You mean she's just out? Yeah. A long way out, but not dead. From the looks of things, she must have put up quite a scrap. Maybe she... Wait a minute. What? There's something screwy here. I... Oh, oh Miss Corey! Oh. Miss Corey, what happened? Who are you? Miss Corey's maid. What's happened to her? Well, she's unconscious. Oh, this is terrible. She knew there was going to be trouble. I swear she didn't. Miss Corey, honey, speak How to How do you know that? Because she was worried. She told me four or five times she was going to stay in all evening, like she was expecting somebody. Sure, sure. It figures oh. all the way. Look, look here. Are you sure this is her purse? It certainly is. Was she robbed? Not exactly, but... Oh, yeah, yeah. This clenches it. Oh. Now, look, call an ambulance right away. Get Corey into a hospital and hurry. Oh, yes, sir. Helen, you I... stay here with her. Don't leave, understand? Right. I'll see you. And that's it, Matthews. That's why I broke a few speed laws getting from Corey's garage down here to the warehouse. Because I had to find Pete and tell him before it was too late. I'm still not sure you made it, Marlowe. Look. Look, this was dropped near Brooch's body. I just saw the mate to it in Corey Haynes' garage. Look, that's not conclusive. No, but these are. The papers I pulled out of her purse. Take a look at them. Go yeah. ahead. One glance will tell you where they came from and why. You get it, don't you, Lieutenant? Yeah, I get it. Certainly I get it. What a rotten setup. Well, then you got to let me go up that fire escape and talk to him. He'll listen to me, Matthews. I know he will. I told you once before, Phil, he's been hit and he's cornered up there. It's driven him haywire. He'll probably blow the top of your head off the... Go ahead, go on up and try it. I'll pass the word. As I walked across the street and started up the fire escape, I knew Pete Andrade from someplace in the shadows on the roof was watching me. Every inch of the way. But I climbed up to the fourth floor before I spotted him. His head inched out over the ledge. My own thirty-eight in his hand. I, I went 
down to the fifth floor and it started up the ladder to the roof when it came. Stop there. That's close enough. It's Marlowe, Pete. I know. That's the only reason you got this far. You got lots of nerve, Marlowe. Pete! I didn't bring a gun. Because I just came to ask you a question. Nothing else. A question? Yeah. A big one. Did you use anything on Brucha except your fist, Pete? No. Why? What's the difference? Plenty. I don't think you killed Brucha. What? Is this a trick? No, no. Is look, Pete. A... No trick. Look at this. I found this green suede button near Brucha's body. I thought it came from your jacket, but it didn't. It was torn from a pair of green suede shoes that Corey Haynes had on tonight. Corey Haynes? I don't get you. It means, first, she's a liar. And she saw Brucha tonight. It means she got there after you did. Probably found him unconscious where you'd left him and finished the job with a heavy marble lamp base. You're crazy. This is a trick. Why would she kill him? They were going together. They had been. Until Brucha got interested in Helen. Yeah? After that, Corey was on the way out and she knew it. She decided to get all she could out of him while she had the chance. Go on. Every time she borrowed his car, she used the keys to get into the office. Steal information out of the files and sell it. She was the informer. Let's see. I'm coming up, Pete. How do you know all this? I found some papers to prove it in her purse. She was in a tough spot when Brucha changed his mind about leaving town tonight. Yeah? She had to get the papers back in the files or Brucha would discover they were missing. But Connor, staying in the office, prevented it. So she was trapped. I see. When she saw a chance to kill Brucha and have you blamed for it, she grabbed at it. Are you convinced, kid? I... I almost shot you, Mama. Why did you take such a risk and climb up here? Because your mother has some ideas that I wouldn't like to see her lose, Pete. Also, I wanted my gun back. Well, do I get it? Yeah. You bet. Here. And thanks, Marla. I feel so good now. I guess I can... Now just how you feel, kid. I don't climb fire escapes like this every night. Believe me. It was a long, long time before all the scattered reports were in. Before the doctor in the prison ward had said that Pete would be okay, and before Corey Haynes had put a wobbly signature to a full confession of murder. And still another hour went by as I drove out across the wide, flat valley to San Fernando, where the profile of the hills in the east had already begun to show against the gray dawn rising behind them. And when I stopped in front of the little house and went up to the door, Senor Andrade was there on the porch. She'd waited all night. Her expression didn't change when I told her all that had happened. Didn't change, actually, until I was finally ready to leave. Then she put out her hand and took my arm. The lines of worry in her face softened. Senor Marlo, last night I had but one son. Now this morning I have two. In my heart you will always have a home. I am grateful. Gracias. She was most welcome. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced, directed, and transcribed by Norman MacDonald, and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Gerald Moore may currently be seen starring in Republic's The Blonde Bandit. Featured in our cast tonight were Virginia Gregg, Jack Edwards, Lillian Biaf, Doris Singleton, and Jack Crucian. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road. Those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. 
There's no other end. But they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's transcribed story, The Quiet Magpie. That's a lie! A deliberate, dirty lie! Counsel, will you restrain the defendant, Mr. Calloway, from making another such outburst? Proceed, Mr. Deacon. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was saying, ladies and gentlemen, in further proof that Vincent Calloway murdered his father, Homer Calloway, in cold blood, the state has established that a violent hatred existed between them. A hatred that crystallized through the years as Vincent Calloway grew from a pampered, coddled, only child into an indolent wastrel of a man, content to lavish on himself the profits from the Calloway Oil Company, his father's business, without once lifting so much as a finger in the firm's behalf. That's not true! I worked in the... Counsel for the defense will advise his client that the court will not countenance another interruption of this sort. Thank you, Your Honor. A hatred, ladies and gentlemen, that reached explosive proportions when Vincent Calloway recently took as his bride an ex-showgirl. A woman with a long and tarnished history of flagrant fortune hunting. A woman whom he flaunted in the face of his father's expressed wishes and deep desires to the contrary. Further, the state has proved that just two days prior to his murder, Homer Calloway had decided definitely to change his will. Why? Why, other than to eliminate his son from its benefit? The court requests that the prosecution confine itself to the facts. Continue, Mr. Deasy. Very well, Your Honor. The facts are eloquent enough. Homer Calloway was murdered before his desired changes in his will could be executed. Next, we learn that on the night of the murder, a desperate effort was made by the killer to cloud the real circumstances of the crime by setting the scene to look as though Homer Calloway had surprised a common thief, robbing his private office. This clumsy attempt was at once proved by police officers to be completely faked. The motive was robbery, all right, but on a grand scale. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us proceed to tighten this web of proof around Mr. Vincent Calloway. Let us show beyond any doubt that it was he... There was no doubt about it. Vincent father. Calloway was losing the fight for his life. D.T., the crisp tab colored assistant D.A., was cutting him to ribbons. When they called Felix Lohman to the stand, I turned around and took a good look. Because it was Felix Lohman who had telephoned me earlier and hired me to come to the trial and be on hand when he testified. He was a tired little man with a jaded cherub face who got up and walked unsteadily down the aisle to the bailiff table. He acted like a man on the verge of collapse. Are you uh, all right, Mr. Lohman? Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I believe so. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Take your name. Felix Lohman. Take the stand. Now, uh, Mr. Lohman, will you please tell this court what your association with the late Homer Calloway was? Why, yes, sir. I, I was Homer's best friend for many years. I was his personal advisor and confident until I... Oh. Mr. Lohman, the man's ill. Get a doctor. No, 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 that, that won't be necessary, sir. It's nothing, really. I have a friend here, uh, Mr. Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. He, he'll help me. Is there Mr. Marlowe here? <laughs> Uh, 
That's the way it played. My client was helped to his feet, and as I half carried him out of the room, I heard the judge adjoining court for the day. All the way down to my car, Felix Lohman stayed as limp as a damp bedsheet. But the minute we drove away, he began a recovery that couldn't be credited to the fresh air alone. When we got a few blocks west on Butcher Boulevard, a smile spread over his Cupid doll face like warm syrup over a waffle. That's a good restaurant. Pull in there, Marlo. All right. Mmm, I, I feel like a piece of pie. Uh, now look, Mr. Lohman, not ten minutes ago you were dropping dead in a courtroom. Now you feel like a piece of pie. What is this? Come on, let's go inside where we can talk. All right. My performance at the trial was a fake, a delaying action, Marlo. A bit for time. Oh? And believe me, we need all the time we can get. To do what? To save young Vincent Calloway's life. How about this boot? Oh, yeah, sure. So you think he's innocent, is that it? Why? I've known Vince since he was just a boy. Mm. He's no killer. Couldn't be. It's, it's completely alien to his nature. Well, from what I heard in that hard-boiled court today, you'll need a little something more tangible than that, Mr. Logan. I've got something. Care to see the dinner menu, gentlemen? Uh, no. Just a big piece of cherry pie and a glass of milk for me. Yes, just sir. coffee, thanks. Now, Mr. Loman, sell me. According to the D.A., Vincent had plenty of motive. Oh, he hated his father, all right. We all did, one time or another, Marlo. And got hated right back, too. Homer was that kind. I, hard, lonely, lived on work and nothing else. But the rest of that motive stuff... You mean about the will? Exactly. Ah. Vince expected several years ago to be cut out of his father's will. He was resigned to it. So that's out as a motive for Vince. Well, aren't you forgetting that was before Vince married a very expensive little plaything? Yeah. Maybe she changed his economic philosophy. Uh -huh. Now you're getting warm, Marlo. But you're still a little off. How do you mean? The girl's name is Joyce. Yeah. I'm sure she couldn't change Vince that much, not dive into murder. But I'm also sure that Joyce herself would try anything. Uh, and, and, well, that's where you come in, Marlo. Something fishy, my boy. Extremely fishy. Yeah, yeah well... Gentlemen. Oh. Uh, that's fine, thank you. Now, uh, tell me, what's fishy, Felix? Are you trying to say you think Joyce is a killer? I don't know. I don't know, but I do know that item one, Vince was worried about her for, for some reason a few days before his father's death. So? So, when this mess broke... I checked up on her myself. Mm -hmm. Followed her home a few times. That's at 2313 North Ogden. Mm -hmm. And item two, I saw a man hanging around the place. A fellow with two gold teeth right in front. And dark, five o'clock shadow, a kind of whiskers. I followed him once. Know where Angel's Flight is? Sure. Uh, that's where I lost him. But I learned that his name is Stoner. Stoner, huh? Mm -hmm. What about item three? Blackmail. I don't know how or where, Marlo, but it's there. Oh. And Vincent's caught in the middle, and good and tight. Yes. Mm -hmm. You've got to find out about this. Ah, I wish I could go along, but Joyce knows me too well, and that stoner has spotted me also, I'm afraid. So I guess it's up to you. Uh... Okay, I'll get started. I can reach you where? Home. That stone 3962. 3962. And Marlo, I'm just an old putty daddy But that boy, Vincent means a lot to me. And time is awfully short. Give us your best, will you? I left little Felix Lohman ordering a big piece of cherry pie and went outside. It was almost dark. I decided to try Joyce Calloway on the North Ogden Drive sector first. I finally located number 2313, which was neatly hidden in a series of obtuse redwood angles surrounding the rose-tinted glass front door to an extravagant duplex. I was about to push the buzzer when a door closed at the side of the house. So instead, I stepped back into a dense clump of handy landscaping and waited. It was a man. And enough light filtered along the walk from the street lamp to show his heavy dark beard even after a fresh shave. The light also glittered off a pair of gold teeth front and center. But he whistled through as he passed. Whatever had happened inside obviously hadn't worried Mr. Stoner much. But it began to worry me. I decided to take my chances on picking him up later. After he'd gone, I went up to the door again, and the girl who walked through the entrance hall and taught me. 
but as soft and as glossy as a well-brushed kitten. Maybe it was her yellow shoulder-length hair or the flowing folds of the black velvet hostess gown. In either case, it was even better with the rose-colored glass door out of the way and the unmistakable scent of taboo in its place. Yes. What do you want? You're Joyce Calloway? That's right. I'm Marlowe, Mrs. Calloway, Phil Marlowe. I'd like to come in and talk to you a minute about your husband. Vince? What, mm. what about him? Well, it'll keep long enough for us to go inside, huh? Well, well, all right. Come on in. Uh. This is my apartment. Now, what is it? Well, first, I'd like to congratulate you. The moral support you didn't give him today was real great. <laughs> Too busy shopping to drop in at your husband's murder trial? Why, you... Oh. <sighs> okay, baby, I asked for it. I didn't go because Vince said that he didn't want me to. Now get out. And the next time your lousy district attorney's office wants to find out something, you can Just tell him... Just a minute. <laughs> I'm not from the DA. I'm strictly freelance. The moment I'm interested in a small matter of blackmail and how a man named Stoner ties in. I don't know what you're talking about. You'd better get out of here. Now, listen, baby. I'm tired and it's late. I want to know about Stoner. I don't know any Stoner. Okay, let's make it easy. He's a bird with a heavy beard and two gold choppers, and I just saw him leave by your side door about five minutes ago. Does that help? You're crazy. There's been nobody else in here tonight. Now, now, now get out of here. Sure. Sure. You know, Joyce, you're either awfully dumb or awfully scared. I don't know which. But neither one is going to pay off for you. I promised. Starting an Angel's flight and working west, it took three solid hours of scraping through the scum on Bunker Hill. Before I got a lead on a guy named Stoner. And another hour went by before I actually found the swayback three-story rooming house he called home. The scaly front porch was a clutter of big, rusty bird cages, and the mangy inmates of which complained as I eased the rickety front door open and pushed my way into a moldy smell thick enough to chew. The ragged row of tin mailboxes said Stoner's room was second floor rear. So I started up. I got as far as the landing when I heard a voice in the hall above. I went on slowly until I could see. It was Stoner. He was back to me talking on the whole phone. I got my thirty-eight in hand and listened. Yeah, well... Uh, well, uh... Listen, Joyce, don't worry. I'll take care of him. Yeah, I'll be watching for him. Yeah, I'll meet you just like I said. Only remember, it's not good for us to be seen together now. So be careful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Goodbye, Joyce. You didn't start watching fast enough, Stoner. Who are you? I'm Marlowe. The guy, little cutie pie, just tipped you off about. Don't move those hands, Stoner. I just love to collect that mouthful of old gold you're wearing. You're no cop. What are you going to do with me? What's your angle? I'm going to spill the truth out of you, Goldie. To keep an innocent guy from taking a rap for a murder you and his own charming wife cooked up. What makes you think I'm connected with that? Maybe I've got eyes in the back of my head. That's so? You ain't got eyes in the back of your head. Because if you did, you'd duck. Oh! See what I mean, Marlo? <laughs> Thanks, pal. Let's get out. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... Although the intention of the entire world is now focused on the critical situation in the Far East, there are still tragic remnants of another war in Europe. There are still hungry people, children who need clothes. There is still sickness and the ever-present misery and poverty. Now as before, it is your job to help these people. Help them through your generosity, through care. One $10 care package can feed and clothe an entire family in France, in Italy, in Germany. Send hope to these destitute peoples of Europe by showing you care through care. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and Corey, the quiet magpie. The 
feeling of being hit from behind becomes more or less routine. <laughs> There's an explosion against the back of your head. Your backbone is suddenly electrified and your legs melt. And a chunk of the floor rushes at you from a cockeyed angle. Where it connects, there's a second explosion and you start down that long black corridor. Very sick to your stomach. Yeah, it's routine, all right. But that doesn't make it any easier every time it happens. I rolled over onto my back in that musty hallway at Stoner's rooming house and forced my eyes open. As I did, I felt a stinging pain like a pinprick in the center of my spine. Then if things started back into focus, I saw a beer bottle gripped in a fat, freckled hand that belonged to a fat, freckled face that peered into mine. It started a conversation just before I could get the pinprick in my back. Well, 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 look what the cat has dragged in. And who are you, chum? The jewel tea man. You need... Oh, oh, my back. Well, what's the matter, chum? <sighs> the little gold ornament. Oh, do you bust the road onto it, chum? Yeah. Whoever slugged me must have dropped it. Huh. What is it? It looks like a bird or something. Yeah. A magpie in flight. Looks like it broke off or something. Probably a pin from some babe's handbag or bracelet or... Or it's yours, maybe, huh? Well, if it was alive, it might be. Birds are my speciality, or ain't you noticed? Oh? You the landlord here? Yes, that's right. So now back to you. Who are you, chum? Now how come you're folded up in my hallway? Well, it's a long story, and I won't keep you from your birds with it. Hey, hey, wait a minute. Now, don't let the Audubon pitch throw you, chum. I've got a couple of hobbies. Like sticking your nose in other people's business? Like bending noses that get stuck into my business. So clear out, chum, and stay out or you'll see what I mean. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. Whatever you say, bird lover. After all, this is your nest. So long. I figured it would play smoother if I left my tail between my legs and waited for him to return to his birds and beer. So outside, I let ten precious minutes go by before I made my move. Then it was around to the back of a lopsided rusted fire escape and in through an open window to Stoner's room. There I hoped something would tell me where he was going to meet Joyce Calloway. But after wasting another ten minutes, it turned up nothing more than the two words Gate L scribbled on the back of an old envelope, which could have meant airport, train station, or bus depot if they meant anything. I went for the hall phone I'd overheard Stoner use and put through a call to my client, Felix Lohman, to bring him up to date. Arno, this is splendid. Why, from what you see, Vincent Calloway is practically a free man. Now, now, so I understand. Stoner and Joyce Calloway were going to blackmail Vincent... Vincent's father so that Vincent would inherit a fortune and thus be a more profitable target for blackmail. Is that it? Yeah, more or less, with, of course, everything backfiring when Vincent was arrested for the murder. But look, Mr. Lohman, we'll add and subtract later, huh? Right now, we got to catch up to him. Yes, but where? You, you said Stoner got away. Yeah, that he was heading for a meeting with Joyce Calloway. See, I got one thing to go on. I found the words Gate L scribbled on an envelope. Do you have any idea if it would mean a train the, depot gate, or a bus? Gate L? Yeah. Hello, is that what you said, Gate L? Yeah, yeah. Does it mean anything to you? Of course, Gate Elmar is at the oil refinery, the side entrance on Lafayette Street. Holy smoke. Say, Loman, what's the address of that place? It's uh, East L.A., isn't it? Yes, 1100 South Cooper between Kendall and Lafayette Streets. Covers a square block. Uh -huh. Now, look, Loman, do you have a gun there in your place, I mean? A gun? Yeah. Why, why yes, I, I do, Marlowe. Well, good. Get it and go over to the refinery right away. I may need someone who knows the inside, the names and numbers of all doors, windows, and pipes. You got that? Yes, but why not the police? Because they come with bells on. We can't take a chance. All right, just as you say. I'll be waiting for you. Good. I'm closer than you are there at Angel Flight. Goodbye, Marlowe. A million thanks for what you've done already. Why, without you... Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about it later, minute. Mr. Loman. Goodbye. And for me, I'll have... Oh, fine. Now, don't move an inch, chum. You'll get this beer served, bottle and all. Now, Nosy, what made you come back? Buried treasure. You see, it's up here, I know. One of your little birds now, told me... Now, shut up. Remember, smart bloke, you're an housebreaker. And anything I do to you is okay with the law. Now, what's with you and Stoner? Why, do you keep a diary? No, a neat bank balance. And all of it comes from cutting in on the right thing at the right time. So once more, chum, what's with you and Stoner? Well, you see, we went to the same prep school, and I promised the headmaster I'd always keep an eye okay, on... Okay, Snoopy, you asked for it! <laughs> 
light gut. <laughs> I think it right, bird boy. Bum aim goes with a bum temper. You're only just beginning, sweetheart. It's black in here like a pit. When I get my hands on you, you're going to be sorry. You hear that? Well, talk up. Talk up. Come on, yellow belly. Let's hear from you. Come on. Okay. So it's hide and seek, huh? No. Hey, game, bird boy, and you're it. Oh. Now listen to the birdies sing, chum. <laughs> A 20-minute drive from Angel's flight to the Callaway oil refinery in East L.A. and all the way through the wide, deserted streets of the city's heavy industries called home. After three tries, I found the sliding gate marked L. On one side of it, and folded up like a marionette on his day off, was the night watchman. Unconscious, blood oozing from a small cut on the side of his head. And inside, thousands of square feet of pavement dotted with a dozen different kinds of massive black metal oil tanks that were ringed with fat pipes and skinny ladders. And in the pale glow of a half moon looked like the kind of distorted stuff bad dreams are made of. I slipped my 38 out of its shoulder holster, moved into the narrow shadow of a long, low building, and slid a careful step at a time toward a center structure. It was shaped like a giant fishbowl on stilts. And then I heard it. It had come from someplace just under the fishbowl. And as I ran toward it, I was ready for what would be left of Felix Lohman. And I started to curse myself for ever letting him come on ahead on his own. But when I was close enough to where I could see, I quit calling myself names. Felix Lohman was there all right, but very much alive. Alive and holding on tight to a smoking revolver that was still pointing down at the crumpled form of Stoner at his feet. Stoner, who was very dead. Marlo, Marlo, she's up there. She has a gun, Marlo. Look, up on that platform behind those pipes. Hold it, Lohman, get down. But Marlo, you must... Get down, she's got cover up there, we haven't. I don't care. You rotten, scheming woman, you are going to pay for all this. You're going to die even as you killed Vincent's no, father. No, Felix, I didn't. I didn't. Yes, yes, Mrs. Calloway. There's no other way out for you. It's too late for you and your lies. No, 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 it's no, your end, no, Joyce Calloway. An end no, you deserve. Woman, you fool, she'll get you, Loman. You louse. No. <laughs> It'll be your life, Loman, if you don't drop that gun. Well, dear client, what's your answer? Do you drop it or do I shoot again? No, no. I'll drop it. What you say? Okay, George, come on down. Get a good look at your husband's benefactor. Who incidentally murdered Homer Calloway, murdered his accomplice Sona here, and tried to murder you. My shoe. You know, for a smart guy, you're pretty stupid, Loman. You should take better care of your cufflinks. A gold magpie shines in the moonlight, especially when you extend your arm to shoot people. Mahalo. Here. Here, yeah, Loman's the mate, the one that broke off in the hallway at Thona's place. That much of you can still be patched up. All right, Mr. Milo. Now that Vincent's lawyer has heard it and the police have written it down, the press have printed it, how about me? I don't follow it. For instance? Well... Felix Lohman killed Homer because Homer no longer had any use for him. But with Homer out of the way... And I... Vincent, in this place, Felix would be set. Your husband, he could fool. Yes, but the way the whole thing boomed... Oh, that was just I... bad luck. You see, he staged a robbery at Homer's office just to throw the law off. Oh. Well, it didn't. But more than that, it almost nailed Vincent. Still with me? Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, the second house over here. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Oh, what was the blackmail? How come? Well, that was Felix again. And out of whole cloth. You see, if Vincent lost his trial, Felix lost everything he killed for. So using Stoner, he had me playing follow the leader. Like Stoner pretending to have just left my place when you arrived. That's right. Oh. That and Stoner setting everything up nice and neat. You see, he was on the phone all right, but when he knew that I was there, he pulled the switch. And very carefully planted the name Joyce. He did? Uh-huh. And last of all, Stoner being killed by Felix and no longer had any use for him and had a lot of reasons to fear him in what was supposed to be... Self-defense. Get it? Get it. Uh -huh. He gives you a little to go on and then a lot more each time you get there. Yeah. At the right moment, he brings you in with a phone call that tells you to come at once to the refinery. Oh. If you want to help Vincent. Oof. 
how close I came. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Correction. Thank like Mr. Magpie. It told me that Felix was the one who dropped me in the hallway at Stoner's, remember? Oh, yes. That made adding the rest easy. Yes, but how fast you add when it counts. <laughs> well, good night, Mr. Marlowe. Thanks again. <laughs> By the time I pulled up in front of my apartment on Franklin, the black in the sky had started to melt into a slate gray. And my eyes ached for the long sleep that... <sighs> they had come. Well, I sat there for a minute. I lit a cigarette and I thought about birds. Did you, did you ever stop to think how some people remind you of birds? For instance, the landlord. <laughs> If ever I saw a vulture in pants, he was it. And and my client, Loman, a hawk with horn rim. And joy. Mm. A powder pigeon. And then there's Marlowe. I wonder what kind of a bird I am. Hmm. A dead pigeon. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the transcribed cast were Harold Dierenforth, Lynn Allen, Wilms Herbert, Charles Lung, Bill Johnstone, and Ralph Moody. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. <laughs> Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Sound and the Unsound. You know, in my business, you get to the point where you think you've seen everything. In fact, you get there at least twice a week. This time, I was sure of it. It was 10 o'clock at night and stretched across my apartment door was the settee that customarily covered the frayed carpet about 10 paces down the hall. And stretched across the settee was a sturdy female in her twilight years. She was sound asleep. Hey. Hey, lady. Hey, lady, come alive. Huh? Oh. Madam, oh. madam, you're, you're sleeping in my doorway. Oh, oh. oh evening, Mr. Marlowe. Uh. Well, I must have dozed off. What time is it? About 10. May I ask, what's the idea? Oh, 10 o'clock, you don't say. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't have slept, I don't suppose, except the light's bad in this hall. Not fit for reading, Mr. Marlow. Yeah, well, I'll speak to the landlady. Now, what well, is... Well, I guess I'd better put this set tea back where it belongs. Uh... I hauled it up your door so I wouldn't miss you. I can haul it back just fine. Yeah, I know, but you... But you... <sighs> now, then, you remember me, don't you, Mr. Marlow? Lucille Bellows? Well, Lady I... Lady Parmley's friend, remember? She introduced me to you one day in the supermarket. We all began to talk. Oh, sure, it... sure. Uh, uh, we had fun, didn't we? Oh, uh... <laughs> we sure did. Yeah. Oh, by the way, before I forget it, Homer's gone now, you know. Is he real? Mm-hmm. Four months tomorrow. Thought you'd want to know. Oh, I want to know that, sure. Don't really suppose I'd have to bother you if he was still around, but since he isn't, I just came right to you the moment I couldn't stand it any longer. Yeah, well, I'm glad you did, uh... Might as well go into my apartment and talk about it, huh? Well, now, that's mighty nice of you, but we'd save a lot of time if we'd just drive right over to the court now. That way you'd be there when it happens. Drive over to... Be there when it happens. I own that nice little bungalow court just off Fountain and Franklin, you know. Won't take us no time to get there if you've got a car. I've got a car. How did you get here? Walk. Do it every evening. Take a nice, brisk constitutional. Keep an old lady like me in fight and trim. How much do you weigh, Mr. Marlowe? About 190. Why? Bet I can lift you.
It just seemed smarter all the way around to drive Lucille Bellows back to her nice little bungalow court. My memory wasn't as vivid as hers. I didn't remember Letty Parmalee or our hysterical rendezvous in the supermarket or Homer or even Lucille. But the promise of my usual fee made that unimportant. Of two things I was certain, I'd never forget Lucille again, and she probably could lift me. I was still in the dark about everything else as the two of us entered a bungalow at the far end of the court. It was pure Grand Rapids and spotless. You just take that blue chair, Mr. Marlowe. I think that's the best seat. Leastwise, that's where I'm always sitting when it happens. When what happens? The sounds. Good crime, Antley. Don't tell me I haven't told you about them. Well, you've been so busy telling me about everything else. Yes, but I... this is important. Ah. You see, for the last few nights, I've been hearing these strange sounds mm-hmm. coming from Mr. Rogers' bungalow. That's the one right next door. Well, maybe Mr. Rogers is just a little noisy. Huh? Mm, no. The thing is, he isn't even home. Been out of town all week on location. He's one of them grips at the studio. Ah. He lives alone, does he? Well, I should think so. He's a bachelor. I keep thinking him and that Barbara Curtis will get married, but they don't. She comes in every so often, cooks him a nice dinner. Lovely girl, just lovely. He's so handy around the place, you know, always painting and About the, the noises, Mrs. Bellows, what do they sound like? Well, sir, they're just downright strange. Sort of a tapping sound. Thought it was the plumbing there at first. Homer used to be good at fixing the plumbing, and I thought about calling him to check it uh, for wait me. Wait a minute, and then just th- a minute, please. Isn't Homer dead? Did I tell you that? Uh, well, you said he was gone. Oh, well, perfectly logical if you thought so, Mr. Marlowe. Sometimes I tell folks he's dead and gone. Sometimes I tell them he's sicker than a horse and I got him in a sanitarium. But the plain, bald-faced truth is, Homer just up and walked out on me four months ago tomorrow. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Well, you know, sometimes I am, too. Most time I'm not, though. But don't think I don't realize I might be imagining these sounds, Mr. Marlowe. Mm-hmm. I'm getting along in years and it's just as possible it can be... Th- there she goes. What do you make of that? I don't know. Sounds like someone's tapping along the wall. You've got a passkey, Uncle? Sure. I'll wear it right around the neck. Good. Come on, let's go. By George, I wouldn't miss this for the world. You better give me the key. We don't know what we'll run into. Just put me out of your mind, Mr. Marlowe. I'm safe as here as anywhere. Okay, watch it, though. I saw a light in the back. I'm not sure. I'll get the light switch. All right. Hmm. No one in the living room anyway. That you, Barbara? Great, Scott. That you, Mr. Rogers? Hello. Hello. Thought you was away on location. Well, I just got in town a few minutes ago. Boss needed something for the company. He sent me in to get it. Well, sakes alive. Well, I'm that embarrassed at barging in on you this way. Oh, uh, this is Mr. Marlowe, Mr. Clinton Rogers. How do you do, Well, Marlo? I don't blame you for looking confused the way you do, Mr. Rogers. I might just as well face up to it. For the last few nights, I've been hearing some pretty strange tapping sounds coming out of your place here. And I made up my mind I'd call my old friend Mr. Marlowe here to investigate him for me. Oh, I see. Say, well, you don't look too good, Mr. Rogers. Oh, I'm fine. I, Well, we've been working pretty hard. I'm just... Tired, that's all. Well, you see, we heard those tapping sounds a while ago, Mr. Rogers, and then a duller, heavier sound just before we came over. I must say, we didn't hear you come home, Mr. Rogers. Well, I came in the back way. The uh, sounds you heard, Mr. Marlowe, I must have made them. I guess I dropped my suitcases pretty hard. I'm tired, like I said. I hope it didn't bother you. Yeah, but what about the tapping along the wall? I can't imagine what that could have been. I didn't hear it. Mrs. Bellows? Why, Mr. Larry, what on earth? The door was open. I saw you in there. I, I must speak with you, Mrs. Bellows. It's... Well, I simply must speak with you. Well, all right, Mr. Larry. We sure were just thinking of you, Mr. Rogers, when we blew in here unannounced, you know. Sure, sure, I know, Mrs. Bellows, and thanks. Don't mention it. I'll be in my bungalow if you want me, Mr. Marlowe. That's fine, Mrs. Bellows. Well, you think we ought to take a look around, Rogers? No. No, I don't think so, Mr. Marlowe. Mrs. Bellows could have imagined all those noises, you know. Yeah, she could. But I couldn't. Anyone else got a key to your place here? Why... Barbara Curtis, for instance? Mrs. Bellows told you. Yeah. No. No, but Barbara knows where I keep the extra key outside. But as far as I know, she's out of town, too. Hmm. By the way, what studio are you with? Imperial. Uh Uh-huh. Look, Mr. Marlowe, I'm really pretty tired. There's nothing wrong here, I'm sure, so... So it's okay with you if I leave now, huh? Well, I just... It's all right, Rogers. Oh, by the way, Mrs. Bellows tells me you're a pretty handy guy around the house, painting, keeping things fixed up, all that. Yeah, I guess I am. Why? Well, you just probably haven't had time to fix that crack in the plaster there running up in the hall closet. Why, no, no, I haven't. 
I'll have to get to that soon, too. Mm -hmm. That's been nice seeing you, Mr. Rogers. Yeah, same here. You plan to stay in town? Well, sure. I'll be in town. All night. There was something eating at Clinton Rogers, something pressing, but he wasn't talking about it, not to me anyway. I knew one thing, he'd never seen that crack in the plaster until I pointed it out to him. It was on the wall next to Lucille Bellow's bungalow, and it was the kind of crack that could be made if someone tapped along the wall looking for something. So much for deduction. I went back to check in and out with Lucille. I, I'm just real sorry, Mr. Marlowe. Maybe it's all been over nothing at all. Well, yeah, Mr. Rogers will be home all night, so if you hear anything, just pound on his wall. Well, if he's going to be here, I'll feel better. I really will. Say, how about your friend who called you out of Mr. Rogers' bungalow a while back? Mr. Larry? Yeah. Well, now, he's a nice soul. Not the protective sort a woman usually sets her cap for, but Lord Almighty, I'm strong as an ox, you know. Yes, I know. Of course, I don't think he makes a dime. Mr. Larry's in women's hats, you know. No, but I could have guessed. Just why I'd hold out for a man who could support me, I couldn't tell you. Well, you look as though you've done all right by yourself. Well, I have, matter of fact. Got myself quite a little nest egg. Want me to show it to you? No, no, I'll take your word for it. Hey, wait a minute. You don't keep any amount of money here in the house, do you? Sure, I'll keep it in the cigar box, right up in the storage part of that hall closet there. Oh, safest place in the world. Yeah, well, it's your money. Hmm. Well, this could take it to the bank, maybe tomorrow, if you'd feel better about it. Yeah, you do that. Oh, uh, before I go, are all the bungalows alike? Mm hmm, just alike. All have that storage space in the hall closet. Right? That's right. A little trap door thing at the top of the closet. It's like a little attic, you know. Mm. You stash a lot of stuff up there if you're of a mind. Yeah, I guess you can. Well, I think I'll go now, Mrs. Bellows. Give me a call tomorrow, will you? Yes, sure will. And I'll have your pay for you then, if that's all right with you. Oh, sure. It's just fine. Good night, Mrs. Bellows. Good night, Mr. Marlowe. And a million thanks. Just a million. My pleasure, Mrs. Bellows. <sighs> oh, Mr. Huh? Marlowe. Oh, Mr. Larry, isn't it? Oh, yes, yes, it is. I, uh, well, I know who you are. I, I, I mean, the Philip Marlowe and all that. And all that. Well, that's good. Now we know each other. Huh? I've really become quite chilled waiting for you to come to see us. Is that what you've waited to tell me? Certainly not. Confidentially, Mr. Marlowe, I know something that may interest you. Oh. Mm. I, well, it's quite obvious to me that something's going on around here. Something odd, I mean. Are you closing in on a point? Because I wouldn't want you to get any more chill. Very well, Mr. Marlowe. I'll be brief. But it just may interest you to know that I've seen Homer around here. Quite a bit. In the last few days. <laughs> now, what do you make of that? I don't know. What do you make of it? Well, I don't know. I must say, I thought it would mean something to you. Yeah, well, it might mean more to Lucille. Why don't you just trot in and tell her all about it? Well, I will. I'll just do that. And I'm sure I'll never trouble you with any of my ideas again, Mr. Marlowe. Goodness. Yeah, well, Lucille's as strong as an ox. Oh, that bed's gonna look real good. Hey! <laughs> In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, CBS Radio puts out the welcome mat for three of its greatest stars tomorrow night. Jack Benny and his gang start the new season. My Friend Irma becomes a regular Sunday feature on CBS Radio. And Tony Martin will rejoin Joe Stafford on the Contented Hour. Be listening for Tony and Irma on most of these same stations and Jack over them all. More than ever before, CBS Radio is the star's address. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe in tonight's story, The Sound and the Unsound. The scream was Lucille's. The shots could have been anybody's. A little bungalow caught came alive as I raced back up the sidewalk to Lucille's bungalow. The lights came on in every unit except one. Clinton Rogers' bungalow was dark. Lucille bolted out of her front door to meet me. Oh, 
Mr. Marlow. Thank the good Lord you heard me. Where'd the shot come from? Mr. Rogers' bungalow. Here, take my key. Uh, I've got to tend to Mr. Larry. What's with him? Fainted dead away when he heard the shot. Oh. I'll come in as soon as Mr. Larry comes to. Okay. Rogers? Rogers? Where are you? Hey, Rogers? Here. Huh? In the kitchen. Hey, you really caught one, didn't you? Yeah. My shoulder burns like fury. Well, who was it, Rogers? Let's say I did it, huh? All right, what'd you do with the gun? Ate it, of course. Oh, now, look, I'll have to call the police. It'll be a good idea if you tell me what happened. Listen, there's a bottle in the first can up there. Get it, will you? I need a drink. Okay. Just uncap it. I don't need any glass. Here you go. <clears throat> oh, it's great. It burns, too. Everything burns. Here, have a drink. Thanks. Well, okay, Rogers, I gotta call him now. Yeah, yeah, okay. First, though, listen. Will you call the studio? Yeah, I'll call him after we get you to a hospital. I'll tell him you had an accident. No, no, tell him. I. I quit. Quit? Yeah. What look? No, no, don't, don't argue. Just tell him that. Okay, it's a promise. Now, and listen. Hmm? Tell Barbara to. Tell Barbara to. Yeah, Rogers, tell Barbara what? Tell her. I called the emergency hospital in Hollywood and their ambulance was there in no time so was a squat little sergeant Lucille followed him in I had two hunches that I was keeping to myself for the time being one that whoever had shot Clinton Rogers was in his bungalow when he got back from location that they were there when Lucille and I barged in on him and two that they'd left by the back door after they'd plugged him even the sergeant could see something of interest in that back door the screen's been cut through here, see? The way it's cut, the fella could unhook the screen door, see, and get right at the back door. Yeah, well, that's very good, Sergeant. But tell me, why do you think it was a fella who shot Rogers? Well, it could have been. You don't think it was a dame, do you? It's happened before, you know. Excuse me, gentlemen. I know you're busy finding clues and all that, but don't you think I could clean up this kitchen floor? It's a terrible mess. Don't you know? touch nothing. Well, it seems to me that you He could... said don't touch nothing. <laughs> Sergeant will let you tidy up things tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's soon enough. Well, all right. I think I'll go back to Mr. Larry now. He's just undone about this whole thing. I'll be in my place if you want me for anything. I'll say good night for now, anyway. Good night. Good night. Well, I'm satisfied for the time being. I'll give you a lift back to the station, Sergeant. I'd like to check on Rogers at the emergency hospital on the way. Yeah, so would I. If he's in shape, I want to talk to him. <laughs> The news from the emergency hospital wasn't too good. They'd taken a slug out of Roger's shoulder at 38. He'd lost a lot of blood and was still out. I left Roger's phone number as the place I could be reached if his condition changed. And before I left, I checked the city directory, which made my next stop a very interesting one. Hey, the studio's closed, mister. You can't get in at this time of night. Are you Homer Bellows? That's right, and I'm the night watchman here. Why? <laughs> well, Clinton Rogers works here at Imperial, too, doesn't he? Uh-huh, but he ain't here. He's in a company that's out on location. Leastwise, I think they're still out. You a friend of his, Homer? Well, you might say so. I know him. You used to live next door to him, didn't you? Yep, I did. Hey, who are you, anyway? Well, I'm a guy who wants to know what you've been doing around Rogers' bungalow recently. Rogers' bungalow? Yeah. Been doing nothing. Except passing it on my way to my wife's. What infernal business is it of yours? Well, none, really. But I'm a friend of your wife's, oh, Homer. Oh, I... you are, are you? Well, if you're such a friend of hers, why don't you ask her what I've been doing around there? Does she know? Does she know? I've been asking her for a divorce since you're so nosy. I want to marry me someone else. Oh, won't she give it to you? Oh, she's agreeable to the divorce, all right. The thing that's holding her up is a settlement. Oh, a settlement. Yep. You see, I lived with that one almost 40 years. And I think that entitles me to a nice little wad of her money. Lucille, don't see it that way. Yeah, well, 
Some women have next to no understanding about things like that. But my visit with Homer served its purpose. I went back to Roger's bungalow in case the call should come from the emergency hospital. And this time I wanted a good look at that crack on the wall, in the storage compartment in the hall closet. I kept Lucille's passkey, and this time I didn't bother with the lights. I used the flashlight for my car because I was pretty sure whoever had shot Rogers hadn't found what they were looking for. I just opened the hall closet door when I'd heard it. Someone was unlocking the front door. I moved quickly behind a big chair in the living room. Jump tiptoe, bud. We've got to be quiet. Yeah. Well, what about lights? We'll, we'll try to make the flashlight do. Okay. But I still don't think this much of an idea. Oh, I was afraid to come alone, bud. And I've got to find it before Clint comes back. You could just take my word for it, you know. You wouldn't have to be here at all. I've told you. I can't believe what you've said. I've got to find out for myself. Maybe you'll be sorry if you find out. Maybe so. But at least I'll know then. That little storage place here in the closet is the only place I haven't looked. Do you think this will be enough light? Yeah. But how'll I get up there? I can't reach that door from here. Oh, well, wait. I'll get the stool from the no, I'll get it. No, no, I've got the flashlight, bud. I'll... <gasps> oh! Oh, good heavens, bud. Here in the kitchen. It's blood. Yeah. Sure is. <gasps> Who's that? Hey, Don't what? reach for anything, bud. You're covered. What's happened to Clint? Somebody shot him. Oh, no. He's not dead yet, Miss Curtis. You know my name? Yeah, he mentioned you. I'm Philip Marlowe. Mrs. Bellows called me in on this. Oh, why don't you put the gun down, mister? I will when I find out a few things. Where is Clint? I want to go there. Police took him to the emergency hospital. Police? But... Yeah, they're going to call me here and tell me how he is. He was still out when I left a while ago. Come on, bud. You've got to take me there. Why? Yeah, Barbara, sure. I... Yeah, not yet, kids. Not till you, you two tell me what you came to find here tonight. And the other nights you've been here. Other nights? You said a while ago you'd looked every place but the hall closet. But I've never been here at night. Not without Clint. Don't talk to him, Barbara. You don't have to. I won't. Mr. Marlowe, you can't keep us here. I have to go to Clint. I have to be with him. I'll get that. Don't forget you're still covered, Buster. Yes? Marlowe? Yes, Sergeant. How's Rogers? He's over the hump, okay. They gave him a sedative a while ago. He's out like a light. But he's going to be all right. I see. Did he say anything? Were you able to talk to him? I was able, but he wasn't. Sort of delirious, I guess. Mumbled something about Barbara. And then just after they gave him the shot, he said over and over... Don't be a fool, bud. Don't do it, bud. He did, huh? Well, that's something. Is it? Sure is. Thanks, Sergeant. I'll call you back. What did they say about Clint? Well, it looks like we're looking for a murderer now. Oh, no. Take it oh. easy, honey. We had one break, though. Clint! It'll interest you, bud. Will it? The police know who shot him. Clint told them. Bud! But... What are you doing? Just protecting myself, Barbara. You want to use that gun now, Marlowe? I'm keeping her right here in front of me. Yeah, I see. Uh, I thought you'd have a thirty-eight, bud. That kind of clinches it, doesn't it? Not yet, it doesn't. Bud, please, don't. Stand still and shut up. Drop your gun, Marlowe. Let it go, kid, and we'll talk about this. You won't get hurt unless you hurt her. Drop your gun. Bud, someone's coming. Mr. Marlowe. Look out, you two. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, my. Thanks for the souvenir, bud. Oh, my goodness. Good work, Mr. Marlow. Barbara, honey, are you all right? Yes, I'm all right, Mrs. Barrow. How about that, Mr. Larry? Coming in when you did, you're nothing but a bloody hero. Oh, my. I feel so. Good Lord, there he goes again. Lucille was a past master at reviving him by now. She hauled him sack-style over to the couch while I told Barbara her Clint was going to be okay. I kept Bud immobilized until the squat little sergeant arrived with a squad car. They hauled him away. I dug the 38 slug out of the plaster and gave it to the sergeant. When the show was over, Mr. Larry obligingly snapped too. You feel like walking, Mr. Larry. I could carry you to our, your bungalow, you know. Oh, mercy no, Lucille, I'll walk. If you just let me use your arm for support. <laughs> You're just welcome to it, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can I help? Well, no thanks so much, Mr. Marlowe. We'll manage. You give Mr. Rogers my best, Barbara. I will. I'll be glad to. You know, Lucille, I'm beginning to see the value in the love and protection of a strong woman. <laughs> 
How about that? <laughs> She'd be good for him, too. <laughs> yeah. Now, look, honey, what's this all about? You've been looking for something, so has Bud, apparently. Clint got himself shot because of it. Now, what is it? Bud said it was money, that Clint had some hidden here in the house. Oh? I didn't believe it. Still, there, there was something between Clint and me, something he wouldn't tell me. Whatever it was, it's, it's kept us from getting married. What was Bud's story? Well, you see, Bud's known Clint a long time. He just came out here a couple of months ago from Ohio. Clint didn't seem to want us to get acquainted, Bud and me. It wasn't jealousy. It was something else I couldn't understand. Mm -hmm. Last week, Bud told me that Clint had robbed some store back east, that he'd been caught and, and served some time, but they'd never found the money and that, that Clint somehow escaped from prison, came out here, and brought the money with him. Well, that could be. Clint caught Bud looking for something here tonight. By the way, where'd you run into Bud tonight? Oh, just about a block or two from here at the mm. corner. I was driving home from a movie. Decided to come up here for one more look before Clint got home. I... I insisted that Bud come with me. He didn't want to. Now, yeah, let's see what we can find. No one's opened that little trap door in the hall closet yet. Maybe that's got all the answers. <laughs> It's a strong box, isn't it? Yeah, it's not very heavy, though. Yeah. There, I see now. No. no money at all. A couple of war bonds made out to Clinton Rogers and or Thomas Rogers. Clint said he didn't have any family. Hey, look, look. Here's an envelope with your name on it. Oh, uh, for Barbara Curtis to be opened in case of my death. I don't know what to do. Well, don't look at me, honey. I can't decide for you. You, well, you will go with me when I tell him, though, won't you? Sure I will. My darling, this newspaper clipping will tell you why I couldn't marry you. When you read it, you'll see why. I love you, Clip. I'm afraid to read the clipping, Mr. Marlowe. Let me see it. Not pretty, honey, but it isn't about Clint. But then who? It's about Thomas Rogers, who at the age of 16 murdered his father and mother. The story says... He escaped from the Ohio Asylum for the Insane in June of this year. Officials think he may attempt to contact his brother Clinton in California. And Bud is... Yeah, it's his picture with the story. Oh, Clint. Poor Clint. What a horrible, horrible thing for him to live with. Yeah. But honey, Mr. Larry said it a little while ago. The love and protection of a strong woman? Clint has it, Mr. Marlowe. I've never been so strong or so protective. And I've never loved so much. <laughs> It was almost dawn now. I drove Barbara over to the hospital in Clint. We didn't say anything. There wasn't anything to say. Nice girl, that Barbara. All woman. You know, I never could understand the guys who pronounce woman as wool man. <laughs> what would we be without them, huh? Oh, they have their faults, but what would they be without them? Yeah, truly it's been said. There's nothing like a dame. I wonder what Rita is doing tonight. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, starring Gerald Moore, was produced and directed by Cliff Howell and written for radio by Kathleen Height. The cast included D.J. Thompson, Olin Soule, Ted Osborne, Frank Gerstel, Arthur Q. Bryan, Shirley Mitchell, and William Tracy. Gerald Moore may currently be seen in the Santana production, Sirocco. The special music for Philip Marlowe is composed by Pierre Garagank and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Now, here again is the star of our show, Gerald Moore. Thanks, Roy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls... Tonight's broadcast concludes our current series of the adventures of Philip Marlowe. I understand it won't be very long until we meet again. So until we do, we won't say goodbye for just so long. See you soon. I still wonder what Rita's doing tonight. Mm -hmm.